Thank you for waiting. Now I like to commence sustainable territorial development in Italy, organized by Hose University Innovation Management Studies Center. We like to begin international symposium regarding sustainable territory development in Italy. And this is to talk about territorial strategy in Italy. This is a com、um, commemorating the publish publication of a book titled Territorial Strategy in Italy. I am here to facilitate this symposium. My name is Junko Kimura from Hosei University. And、this symposium consists of two parts. First part is about is is the eight panelist authors of the books is going to talk about this topic, and the second part is going to be a talk session amongst the eight pan panelists. And upon the commencement of this symposium, let me introduce the book that we are publi publishing.、Um, Italy rural. Embraces countryside blessings. It embraces soul life culture and locally produced and locally consumed. And Enogastoria is the Italian characteristics. And this is based on a new paradigm following development oriented theory. And from the territorial perspective, we study、uh, why Italy is so attractive. And this book. Innovation Management Study Center was authored, but、um, in Hakuto,、um, public publisher is going to publish book、um, coming March, and the panelists are authors of the book, and they、um, they have. Um, expertise in Italy in different fields about territorial values, and they are going to present how we can revitalize rural areas, and those who are interested in revitalizing rural areas in Japan. Thank you very much, and I'm sure that you can learn a lot. From、um, the case in Italy, I like to introduce the panelist. The first panelist is Mr. Jinai Professor. Mr. Jinai is a、uh, is is the special professor, and he organizes、um, different、uh, specific order fields. And Mr. Jinai, in since 1970s. And、uh, since half century, he's been、uh, following the development of Italy, and from urban to territorial, he expanded his purview to include territory. And the revitalizing model can be applied to、uh, Japan countryside that is declining. And myself, Junko Kimura, is going to、um, give a presentation two years in Italy about. Protected designation of origin and protected geographical indication. Those are what I studied. And since I came back, I have been involved in the PGI and PDO. And、uh, Mr. Jinai, from I expanded my purview. As well, and the third panelist is from、uh, Ministry of Fish, Fishery and Agriculture, Mr. Kumiyaki Suda, and、uh, agriculture in France and agriculture or rural and EU policies are what he mainly studies, and he talks about terroir in France in Italy.、Um, Territorial and Toscana Chianti wine case studies. Those are、uh, some of the studies that he's going to share. And also, we are joined by three、uh, Italian panelists in live. And today it's five o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning. Those who are joining us early, thank you very much for working with us、uh, early morning. And the first、um, panelist, Andrea Marescotti. In Europe, he is the leading figure in GI, and also、um, UN. He works with、e、U UN and、uh, contribute to the development of the system, and、uh, also University of、um, Giovanni is also the co-author. But、uh, Marescotti,、um, Professor Marescotti, is joining us, and the second、uh, panelist from Italy is Miss Barania Stanisha, Assistant University. In Rome University, and in his book,、um, he talks about.、Uh, she talks about 
um, value, a new value, that slow movement and enogastro tourism. She um, thoroughly covers important aspects in a slow movement. And what we see a small picture is her husband, and her uh, husband translated um, her book, and we had he was a great contributor to this book. I like to thank you for his contribution. The third panelist from Italy is a uh, professor Monta Fontanari, Sapizia University. He um, used to teach tourist tourism, but he's a uh, vice president of a startup company. And uh, with Jin Nai, Mr. Jin Nai, he's been studying since the 1970s and in the 70s. In Osaka Expo, he was also a great contributor to the um, success of the Expo in mobility and tourism with the, what he mainly studies. And he's been a leading figure in the field and the pandemic caused tourism paradigm shift. And that's what he's going to talk to us about in his presentation. Let's turn to Japan. And the seventh panelist is Ms. Kazuko Nagamoto. Ms. Nagamoto, without her in Japan, Italian uh, cuisine will never be so popular without her contribution and uh, up-and-coming Italian chefs. Um, she, by all students that she organized in her seminars in Italy. And in the past, Italian cuisine was never being structured, but uh, from a territorial uh, standpoint or framework, she put a structure and to make it more attractive. And the last but not least, Mr. Uh, Tana Uwe is just a certified Somalia, and she's accredited by Italian ambassador, um, embassy. Italian wine, you might think it's fine, uh, Italian wine is difficult to understand, but from a territorial perspective, we can start to see um, what a unique uh, attractiveness that Italian wine offers. So from geographical perspective and history perspective, uh, he's going to talk to us about Italian wine and those eight panelists sharing their expertise. From a territorial standpoint, they are going to uh, give us presentations. And the second part is talk session, and Mr. Jin Nai is going to facilitate the talk session to extract um, the expertise of each panelist. And now I'd like to uh, welcome Mr. Jin Nai, the first, um, first panelist, Mr. Jin Nai, from Centorial from Historical to Territorial. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. So I'm really pleased that uh, we can hold the symposium. So I heard uh, 334 people applied for this symposium. Um, there are a lot of interest in uh, various kinds of people and really appreciate it. So there are three presented from Italy, the online real time, and thank you very much for the participation. So my major uh, is the architecture of the city, and uh, I also are interested in the agriculture village and also the city history. So I watched uh, various kinds of trend in Italy for more than 50 years, and uh, we are experiencing the various kind of changes, and I touched upon uh, the various kind of changes and the concept of the Italy on the various kinds of perspectives. So I'd like to give you uh, my thoughts uh, for the many people. What is the image of the Italian city? Maybe it has been changed drastically. For some, the place for a visit has been changed in 1970s and 1980s, the Florence. So uh, I'll give you an example of the Toscana. So lots of people have been to the Florence, and then uh, the popular the place has been shifted to uh, Siena in 1980 to 2000, and then after 2000. So, uh, lots of people are interested in a small city, and they're also interested in the gastronomy, the culinary uh, history. So what is the central historical? 
So this is an Italian language. When you go to Italy, uh, you can remember this term very quickly. So Italian people are really good at expressing themselves. So gentle historical is one of the key words to understand the Italian. In 1960, in the small city of the Umbria, the Scubio, the small conference has been held. Before that, so, Italian people lost various kinds of uh, the history of Luke because of the words were true. So, uh, historical is the history of the city. And then there is a movement. It's very important that the small uh, the conference had been uh, held in Cambodia, Gubbio. Uh, for example, uh, you can see the photo of the Lupka. So, uh, this is a typical example of the Chenzo historical. So, it is surrounded by walls, and then the whole city had experienced revival. Not only preservation, but uh, that kind of city had been revitalized and uh, liberated their historic politics. This movement had been appeared in 1970s. So, uh, the Italia was moved uh, in ahead in the 1970s and 1980s. So Toscana Luca was uh, one of them. So I experienced the real-time recovery in that, that area. And then the, one of the magazine called uh, Toshi Jutaku, it's a city, the housing uh, picked up the articles of uh, Central Historical. So you're now seeing the stone walls, and then inside of the stone walls, there are historic relics. The blue areas are uh, for the commoners. The commoners are uh, living in that area. But uh, many you know, areas you know, have been deteriorated and some of them becoming slums. So the uh, government put various kinds of budget for uh, regeneration. So Central Storico is again uh, one of the key terms for the preservation to the regeneration in 1970s and 1980s. Everybody talked about the uh, Chantel historical. So Japan and Italy are look alike. After World War II, uh, after the defeat of the war, they experienced the industrialization. However, they experienced uh, the so-called unbalanced uh, the population of the city. For example, in uh, the rural areas, they experienced hollowing, and in the cities, uh, so many people have been concentrated. So in order to revitalize and revive the balance, there are various kinds of small movement. So it is based on the, the articles in 1976. So, uh, this is the Vival, the project of the conservation of the city. So these kind of uh, the project has been fruitful. Lots of you know, small city regained the glory of the village. So Territorico uh, had also been used in 1970s. Uh, Professor Maletto, uh, he's uh, one of the presenters, and he, he you know, talked about the te territorio uh, in the earlier times. Uh, for the application of the typological uh, the study of the urban regeneration. Uh, Professor Mratori uh, wrote about uh, the Chiruta territory in 1967. Uh, of course, there were the small movements uh, in the 1970s, but in 1980s, it has been uh, the flourish. In 1976, the Kanicha uh, wrote about the country Side landscape uh, surrounding the cities. For example, so they are transcending the culture the surrounding the Romans. Not only the urban fabric, but also the surrounding areas of the public have been embraced. So take a look at the Italy and Japan, uh, the balance that has been deteriorated due to the industrialization. So uh, lots of you know, people reviewed. This uh, the movement, and uh, there's another terminology called the morphology. So, uh, they also need studied about the geology and ecology. 
So BDS kind of study has been gathered in order to revive the balance of the cities and the peripheral areas in 1980s. The Italy uh, came back, and the protagonist had been shifted uh, from the city to the rural areas. In the 1960s and 1970s, the cities were protagonists for the industrialization. But uh, afterwards, uh, the Milano, uh, not, uh, not the Milano, but the small uh, the cities, and also the small you know, companies uh, based on the family members had been vanished. And it had been led uh, to the movement of the furnishing the culinary uh, the culture in Italy. So, Gentle Storico had been revived. So you are now seeing the picture of the uh, plaza. So at that time, the Como, the city Como, had been already uh, became the popular. So uh, they are you know, really the popular thing to uh, for uh, uh, creating the threat. So it is called the district industrial. So lots of uh, industry had collaborated with each other uh, for uh, creating a new kind of fashion. At the same time, in 1980s, revalue of the uh, countryside had also been embraced. So modernization and industrialization uh, the first in the 1970s, but uh, they you know, had come up with the idea of uh, territorial the function. Uh, the paisage, uh, which means the paisage or the landscape, is also another important term. In 1990s, the so-called cultural landscape had also put importance uh, and then uh, there's a movement of the slow the food, so in 1986. And then uh, in 1999, so there is another movement called the Chitta Slow for leveraging the asset of the local city for the changes in the Italy's economic base, so which means fashion, design, and industry for the protagonist uh, in the 1970s, but uh, it has been shifted. Uh, to the productive activities based on blessings of soil, earth, and nature. So, uh, as the presenters were talking about the culinary, the culture, in gastronomy, the in gastronomy connects the city and the countryside. So, what is the territorial? So there is uh, the so called the natural surroundings, uh, territorial between the city and the surrounding rural areas. So in these surrounding areas, uh, they were involved in the fishing, the farming, agricultural industry, forestry, and so on. And the tradition and history in local communities are boring, and those are people uh, go about their everyday lives. That's territorial. But that was broken by modernization in the in 80s, and after that, the broken territorials was being revitalized in Toscana. Uh, we studied. Um, Baldocha. We have been studying Baldocha. Um, Jose University has been studying, doing a legwork. And there are five communities. And uh, now it is a resistance of heritage. It, there's vast uh, space and nothing there, but it was um, registered. But uh, it was a uh, pil pilgrimage road. But uh, there were five um, scattered around communities, but they came together together to have that uh, Baldocha registered as heritage. It was losing population and agriculture was declining. It was losing the steam. However, um, there was a process that brought back the city of the community to life and it was marginalized. And in the past, so it was almost selected as a waste 
uh, industrial waste landfill, but people stood up. It was not a just demonstration for the sake of objecting, but that they came to, they decided to take that activity uh, more positive to build a park or organization, and they built an organization to reveal the community. So tourism, tourist protecting environment and creating brands, they did a lot of activities, and, and that led to uh, World Heritage Registration. Now it's being, um, they are doing even more. And uh, those territorial potential that was untapped, they um, tap, tapped into potential of territorial and it became World Heritage. And the Siena, these are wall painting, and uh, you see the harmony of urban city and countryside. This is a quite famous painting. And the, in the expansion of this wall painting, and they protected identity of scenery or landscape. So that process of revitalizing the community was uh, recognized and then registered as World Heritage. Um, Baldacher is a small uh, community, but it has a close link between urban and the countryside. And a small towns in the, in the Middle Age, they had ordinance, and now urban and countryside are linked. And Max Weber I thought um, negatively about it, but the, that was regarded as um, lagging behind. But in the 2000s, this has become their um, advantage. They, they can proud off, and the rural area is now being um, honored. In the past, we can see that from the documentation from the past. And this is Kabuseo. This is a, a ledger to manage real estate in, in agriculture or crops. From those documents, we can follow what happened in the past. And the transition of landscape can be studied by those documents. And those are the small towns that we have been studying. And, uh, for example, there is a space instead of uh, landowners, there is a community or commons. There was a space where people come together in the past, and uh, there's uh, agriculture facilities were converted into restaurants today. And, and uh, also, we had a presentation at Renovated a Church, and we had a party or, um, in uh, Renovated Restaurants in those local areas. This is a small town, and in the small town, that's the firm houses it became uh, turned into guest houses or B&B, &B. and uh, due to um, the advancement of innovation technique, those firm houses are turning into spaces where we can just enjoy slow life, which is a quite luxurious time. And now countryside are getting a lot of attention these days. Those are the rationale behind why agriculture or rural is getting so much attention. I think Italy was an original asset, and now it's the asset is getting re-evaluated after modernization or industrialization. It was a rural area was just marginalized, but actually there's so much asset or potential um, that can serve different um, purposes of people and that can build economic foundation and also biodiversity. Uh, this is a, a front line of protecting diversity in 2000 and after that in Italy has been very active in uh, active in leading charges like kilo metro ergastronomia were locally produced and locally consumed. It became very important. Ergastronomia is one of the main topics today. But when we study in do study in Toscana, we realized how important this is. And uh, Jinta Genosha, it was a Shina uh, hawks. You see the white stripes. And those pigs are quite very tasty. And in the past, people regarded this is um, was, it was not cool to firm this kind of um, pigs or hawks because it was regarded as lagging behind. 
but now it's being the tables have been turned. So there are so many different territories where we have so much potential. And this is another area that we study, Amalfi Coastal Line, Amalfi Historic Center, was getting so much attention, but the, there are so many other parts that are so, um, so attractive and riveting. And Amalfi, Amalfi is an ocean kind, and uh, it was uh, um, in, imported civilization and it became a glory um, parts of the area, but actually in the hinterland we can find attractive parts of towns as well. In the hinterland and the coastal uh, cities or towns are organically uh, interlinked and uh, you can harvest olive, olive and oil and ship, we can build ships and uh, paper mill, uh, producing paper. This was an uh, advanced technique, um, and it became a, such a big industry in the 18th century. So land and this ocean are interlinked, and when the, on the one hand, they had a wine a field, and on the other hand, they had an ocean industry, but the industrialization left them behind, but now they're trying to restore the balance to uh, re-evaluate the area. But due to the pandemic, it's uh, we are unable to travel, but as soon as possible, we would like to uh, organize a tour around Amalufi, Jitala, and those small towns. And those are the symbolic places for enormous gastronomy. And if you go to the south, there is so much more potential as well. And Supuria. And Puria is your Italia, Valde uh, Italia. And uh, since I was a student, I have been studying those areas. And things are becoming more, uh, things are improving, and countryside is started to regaining its uh, glory. And this, uh, when this is where I was in the 90s, and you see middle uh, men are enjoying their time. There is no tourist because everybody would leave the town to work in urban cities. But the, when I was studying, I thought the potential in this place, that this can be a really inviting place. Now it's been coming. Uh, coming back to life, and uh, it was deserted before. It was deserted before. This is how it looks today. And uh, there are so many um, coming to life again, and agriculture is um, revitalized, and agritourism is also becoming big here. And if you visit here, I saw, when I visited, uh, I encountered two Japanese young tourists and uh, this is meat was uh, transported to um, from the farm to the town to be served. And those different communities were separated, but they come to, together to organize festivals. And I did a presentation, and the, the communities came together to revitalize the territorial. And this is something we should, we would like to emulate in uh, Japan. And uh, we are doing similar studies in uh, Japan. And uh, this potato, Kim, Mr. Kimura has connection here. Look at this amazing view. This is, this is a view that can go toe to toe with Tuscany. So they are enthusiastic about trading the potatoes, they are agricultural the cooperation, and also the local municipalities and the agricultural people uh, collaborated with each other to make a croquette. So they are creating various kinds of cuisine, uh, which is based on the potatoes of Mishima, uh, which is not very far from Fuji and also Mount Hakone. So this is also the sightseeing areas. So they're raising potatoes around here. The farmers are cultivating the potatoes in this area. And uh, so they have an advantage uh, you know, due to the sightseeing area. So in order to really create the producers and register the producer to organize this, they uh, started various kinds of activities. So there is a big shrine called the uh, big, uh, the shrine, the Shima Shrine. 
after uh, it had burned down by fire. And then, so they are collaborating with each other uh, with the local farmers for the local production for the local day, uh, consumption. So Italian gelato had been uh, created and also the Japanese tradition in the Benia collaborated with each other for using the local vegetables and local eggs. So farmers, traditional Japanese eat, are connected to each other. That's why I'm saying that the Japan and Italy are look alike. In the past, uh, lots of people forgot about the good things uh, in the past. The people are now realizing that uh, they have lots of uh, possibilities. So, the Italian people and the Japanese people are cooperating and interacting with each other. So, this uh, symposium is a very good this one of that. Uh, thank you very much. Jinnai-sensei, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. So, next, so I would like to uh, talk about uh, the uh, sustainable region development realized by uh, territorial uh, from Junko Kimura. So, thank you. So, I am from Fosei University. So, I would like to talk about the Italian charms. So, you know, seeing uh, the beautiful uh, the landscape. So, I love uh, the Rufan. I uh, visited nine years ago uh, with a population of 2,100. So, this is a real uh, the landscape uh, that from the castle. So, uh, I spent two years living in Italy following the American management studies approach and I continued my research on our culture and the food products. In uh, 2012, I lived in Italy for two years. So I visited Umberito, uh, the farmer journalist journal maker at the PDO cheese in the Palma. So at the interview, so I uh, you know, asked about the, uh, the production the target. The, he was uh, really confused. So I didn't you know, forget the face expression of Ontario. The large consumption and the large production was a norm in the United States. Uh, but uh, this is a movement when I knew that I had found my way into the world. It is uh, pretty different uh, the, from the U.S. And the farmers. So the craftsmen are making the cheese and wines. So they are really attractive. When I uh, researched you know, about the marketing, I uh, always you know, thinking about the affluent society. The reason why the Italian city is sure really uh, charming is that the agriculture is uh, really near from the, uh, the people. So I researched the food culture uh, in Campania. Uh, Mr. Antonio talked about the territory. So I have heard the term territorial for the first time. So this means a lot of product and also the protecting uh, the uh, geologic uh, the indication. So 
I'm so really amazed you know, by the local consumption and local production. So, uh, one of the units uh, is the uh, local municipality and also the community. So, and Mr. Antonio you know, talked about uh, the so called the competitive advantage, and that's why I was really attracted. So, when it comes to the you know, affluent uh, territorials, uh, geographical indications, uh, contribute a lot. Have you uh, seen this you know, kind of the marks? So geographical uh, indication uh, is made uh, due to the characteristics of the local products. And then when we can identify the region of the production, uh, we can uh, contribute to the protection of the local product. Because we can also protect the uh, technology and the techniques of the local people. And the originality is also really uh, famous. The GI has lots of history in uh, European countries. So the first country is France to make the law. So for example, so to begin with, so it was made uh, for you know, banning so the fake product. In 2022, in January, EU 27 countries, GI, uh, registered uh, the items were totally 1,378. So 70% of the registered products are from uh, these five countries' products. Italy, 312. France, 258. Spain, 199, Portugal, 140, Greece, 113. So in these five countries, uh, the surrounding the Mediterranean Sea consists of 74.1%. And the number one is the Italy. And Italy has a diversity of the food. So they have uh, lots of traditional the local food. They have the characteristics of the craftsmen in the coastal area of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, which exemplifies uh, the characteristics of the GI registered uh, the product. So there are two keywords for expressing the glory of the Italy, territorial and common uh, the spirit. So the industry has a double structure. So please take a look at the upper strata. So this is the city faction, uh, which means uh, have the market for the exchange. Um, the latter one, uh, is for, uh, based on uh, the so-called the communities for the agricultural villages functions. So this is the basic uh, structure of territorial. Uh, the second keyword is the spirit of the commons. As Professor Jin Nai uh, talked about the commons. In Japan, we have you know, similar uh, terminology, which is called satoyama in the countryside areas. So there are the common assets in the communities. So, uh, the comparing to the, the common areas, so there are the private areas. If a person imposes the areas, they only think about the desire of the individuals. In 2021, if a company only thinks about the company, think it is not a good idea. So the economist holds uh, the quota that it's not uh, good. And he criticized about uh, so for the protecting the commons is the spirit of the commons. Please take a look at the photographs. So you are now uh, seeing the interesting uh, the structure of the cheese production. Each uh, dairy you know, product are having uh, very few in accounts. So it's used by you know, Puma A and then today it's B. So they work together for cheese making and individual original cheese was also shared. During the summer, they also have transhumans in Dromite, less flavored area has inefficient 
but they have cheated specific to their territory and the EU protects them by GI law. For example, as GI cheats their montage of Putsone de Moena, Trenting Grana, they cannot run their business without subsidy, but EU supports insufficient agriculture in its common agriculture policy because they know agriculture is multifunctional. Key to solve issues in the 20th century lies in the very rural area in which farming is done. EU is proactive in protecting agricultural produce and food in policies, especially in international trade. EU has taken foreign policies one after another to deepen connection between territorial and agriculture on the ground that agricultural produce and food in locally rooted agriculture become differentiation in a sustainable society. In the past, EU behaved to make GI intellectual property recognized by the world in Uruguay Rounds negotiation for so-called GUT started in 1986. The negotiation was concluded in 1994. EU diverted a backlash from North America in TRIPS agreement and succeeded in treating GI as IP. You may think that efforts by EU here is about six industrialization or industrial cluster, but you will understand it is different from that when you understand territorial and the spirit of commons. The left bottom in the diagram indicates efficiency and industrialization are thoroughly pursued to gain competitiveness. The left top states that geographical proximity generates competitiveness but specific industrial cluster doesn't take identity of the territory into consideration. For example, the Netherlands has a land area which is the same as Kyushu, but it's the sec second biggest exporter in terms of food volume following the U.S. in the world because they concentrate food industry cluster in specific region and have technology-oriented efficient production. The right-hand side of the diagram incorporates connection with the territorial. The right bottom is sixth industrialization, and they strive for individual development of agriculture, produce, and food. The right top shows an activity with the aim of developing overall territorial by launching a project through collaboration among multiple actors in different positions in the spirit of commons. EU supports these projects by territorial approach. EU, especially Italy, has taken back brilliance of ag agriculture rural area through territorial approach. There are three important points. The first point is that subsidy just covered agriculture before, but it was changed to cover promotion of territorial, including city and rural areas. Revitalizing rural areas requires not just economic value generated by agricultural activities, but change of direction to multifaceted value of agriculture across multiple sectors such as rural tourism. The second one is bottom-up project. Territorial approach may look like top-down, but it's a bottom-up approach, and residents and activists proactively take part in those projects from planning phase. They launch projects themselves, and countries and provinces or regions subsidize them. It is necessary for farmers in cities and rural areas, companies, public administration, residents work together for revitalizing territorial. The third one is balance. In order to generate income and economic growth in rural areas, balance between city function and rural function is struck, and the trade-off is achieved by achieved for people's joy, motivation, and environmental conservation using a multi-faceted function of non-economic value generated by agriculture, for instance, landscape, enogastronomy, and educational function. 
In regards to trans humans in Dromite mentioned earlier, is inefficient and has almost no economic value as cattle farming activity alone, but it has contributed to development of territory because it preserves beautiful landscape and promotes rural tourism. Italy has generated unique and attractive products in agricultural activities rooted in territorial because product characteristics are generated by the link with characteristics of territorial. Italy has been working on sustainable rural development, looking to agricultural multifunctionality. They create identity of territory using local resources at first by serving their local consumers. Let me briefly introduce example of Sitchano olive oil in Amiata, Tuscany, on which Professor Jean Naisuda, Andrea Mascotti, and I conducted research in October 2019. Amiata territory located on the western side of Mount Amiata, as Professor Jean I mentioned earlier, was far behind. Valchosia, located on the eastern side of the mountain, explained by him in territorial branding. Olive oil producers who love their rural area work together with the olive farmers on making their area attractive. Mr. Giliotti here is a producer. They created observation deck by themselves so that they can enjoy the view from there. Tuscany subsidizes projects. Italy subsidizes bottom up projects rather than just providing subsidy to any project. Residents consider ways to conserve common or shared goods while utilizing them. There is an olive tree in a public square. However, the root is hung from the ceiling of a defunct water tank or cistern under the public square. This project is called Root of Wisdom, which is very innovative for residents, and they were significantly motivated to revitalize the region because of this. In order to further use existing buildings, they converted the defunct old olive oil mill in Centro Stolico to Olive Oil Museum as distributed museum for tourists to walk around and then stroll inside Centro Stolico. It's called the Museo Diffuso. Rural revitalization through olive oil alone seems to be difficult, but combined efforts in the spirit of commons create a beautiful landscape specific to territorial. The biggest tourist attraction is food and wine as abinamento. Together with Professor Jin Naisuda and Mariscotti, I enjoyed Abinamento for local cuisine and local wine, along with olive oil producers, mayor, tourism association, and important local stakeholders in a kitchen on the second floor of an olive oil mill in Estroganomir, food and wine tourism. Italy has achieved a rich society in matured society. Conversely, I think Japan has still unfortunately been pursuing illusory growth society. A world of a new capitalism has been emerged. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said on November 25th last year that Japan has to achieve virtual cycle of growth and distribution and also consider sustainable economy, furthermore economy which can certainly invest in people. Council to realize new capitalism mentions about Japanese agriculture. It uses twelve lines to talk about agriculture in which its aim is growth without taking territory into consideration and the effort for that are very concrete. It contains words such as smart digital, export technology, facility arrangement, information, efficiency, and size. 
In contrast, it uses only two lines for maritime functionality for 21st century agriculture and doesn't indicate concrete efforts for that. I'd like Japan to learn from territorial strategy in Italy. In Japan, あ、です。現在they are created the association. I am also uh, the uh, あ、で、クリエイトこのトリクミオンで、ポジションシーズは400と Mr. Gennaro said that he carrying out the promotion activities uh, going to the production area of the wine producing areas in Custoza. Seichonしゃかいは終わりました。of Next is a presentation by Professor Suda. The title is Rural Gentrification Through Terroir Products. Professor Suda, please, floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Suda from Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. Today, I'd like to talk about rural gentrification through terroir products. Uh, by using the example Italian Chianti, and today First of all, here in regards to terroir products, mainly centered around the Chianti classical wine, I will talk about Tuscany a territorial development project and Chianti region as a project region was successfully built. That's what I'd like to explain. And characteristics uh, of county project, it's multiplied, and mainly consortium consortium of producers, uh, they work on the rural development and at the same time, uh, there are a kind of association, community uh, association by public administration also has worked for the other rural development as well, and they have worked on the rural development with some conflicts. 
Our next is Terroir. In French and then Territorio in Italy. Uh, maybe in English it's territory. So I would like to briefly touch upon the origin of the words. When we talk about wine and cheese, for example, we often, we often hear the word terroir. In Japan, even some people talk about terroir when they talk about the Japanese liquor. But uh, there is the origin. After 13th century, terroir in regards to grape and wine, expansion of the regions was the word used, and at first it was not a positive word at the beginning. In 19th century, terroir wine was not suitable for urban people because it was a peasant wine. And it was somehow uh, against uh, high grade wine, such as noble wine. And AOC in France, uh, that was the origin of the PDO. And Joseph Capius, uh, who was a kind of a founder of this, was a parliamentarian, but in 1947 he wrote a book saying that in order to justify the AOC zoning, the word was proposed at the beginning, according to him. And when it comes to terroir, uh, there is background why people started to use this word. Let's briefly look at it. Uh, since 1980s in advanced countries, for example, California in the United States, and Australia and South Africa, things like that, uh, they produced the wine in those advanced countries, and on the other hand, the French and the Italian wine producers were struggled because of that. And in order for them to justify their wine in international competition, in order for them to sell more about their wines, they started to use terroir. And there is actually no definition described in international law like WTO TRIPS agreement and EU regulation. But uh, French National Institute of Origin of Equality and the National Institute for Agriculture Research worked together to come up with an identity somehow. And terror uh, definition is follows. Human community constitute collective knowledge uh, based on uh, physical and biological environment, mutual interaction with the entire human element. And social technology trajectory worked in the system represents originality, gives typicality, and generates reputation to products originated in the geographical space. And around the same time, there is also another definition done by UNESCO, and they says they said that. Terroir is geographical limited area where a human community generates and accumulates along its history a set of cultural distinctive features, knowledges, and practices based on a system of interactions between biophysical and human factors. And the definition by UNESCO is somehow different from the former one because it has empowerment element to nurture a crowd among residents. And it's not just reduced to tradition and they added innovative space in it. And typicity is somehow difficult for us to understand in the 70s. 
がですね、ワイン、まあ、メイキング、発明した。Professionals、uh, came up with this concept about typicity, especially in wine industry.、Uh, but recently, it's also、uh, used for cheese and others. And in order to come up with the PDO,、uh, quality characteristics is important in relation to causal association. And there are some conflict related、uh, elements. And one is a g r o t e r w a r way of thinking, for example, agricultural experts and others、uh, focused on. This, and on the other hand, socio t e r o i r French, Jean l o b e l p i t and others started to talk about the importance of history and the market. For example, in order to generate a reputation of b o l d wine, especially they focused on the important role played by merchants. And next, one more thing. In our report, Professor Andrea Maliscotti is a kind of expert, no more than me, but in regards to EU rural development policy and project area. Or a territorial. When it comes to territorial, as a project,、uh, it has a background why it was somehow successful in the 80s under the administration of Thatcher. New public management、uh, swept the world. And also, we started to see the move around the decentralization. And the nation or state withdrew, withdrew from rural development or promotion. It's also somehow related to this. And EU and national budgets were allocated to. Project, bottom up project. And for example, in case of a French, I'm involved in、uh, for the research.、Uh, there are 36,500 communes. Having said that, identity or historical identity of residents. Are also important, so somehow they are struggled to、uh, consolidate communes. And Italy has about 8,000 communes, and in France, they have 36,500, but it's too much for providing enough services. So they started to organize 1,236 extended associations in France, and then after 2008 financial crisis in Italy. They started to show some move of restructuring Chitta Metropolitana. And they became a kind of a player for rural development. So they launched a project, then secured a budget for that. And probably they spent about five to seven years. In case of a rural development policy, typical case is seven years. But anyway, they launched a project, and then after finishing the project, they move on to the next project. Next,、um, local quality, rent, and cooperation and allocations. This is a difficult terminology, but、uh, I think please consider this as price premium. And as Kimura san was、um, talking, Professor Kimura was talking about, it's a premium of.、Um, Local quality and how that premium is created and locally and how it is shared. And terroir products, high added value. There are two ways to add high value to terroir products. One is like Beaujolais Nouveau, the <coughs> products. That to show that、uh, quality is well managed and audited and to 
uh, indicate that to those products and then to our wealthy customers. The product could be targeted to um, targeted for wealthy consumers and also product and landscape. This can be interlinked with tourism promotions, for example, wine tourism, Aldous Wine Road. Um, canteen could be used to um, promote tourism. And in my thesis, the theory that I propose in my paper that France Adman Moirel is a geologist to about basket theory of goods and service. This, of course, um, this was referred to um, Professor Marescotti, but the elements in the theory is that the mainstay terror products can be combined with other product and services, and uh, the symbolic Symbolic images of the image of um, mainstay products that we combine services and uh, other product in one basket and uh, goods and services to be in the basket rather than sold respectively, but the premium can be added. This is to create rent and high added value and uh, local products like a movie screen local products can project landscape or heritage can be co-created by local communities and to that we need to work with local producers and actors and uh, to maintain common goods that we need there has to be uh, rules and uh, community to work together and to that end and uh, rural area policy or uh, people need to be trained this is it's being supported by EU agriculture promotion policy and and what is important is to, to make sure that there's a balance between demand and supply. And tourism is extremely important in this concept. And this is explained in this illustration. In the right-hand side, that we have a market goods. There are products that go into basket or can be Chianti wine that's on the left hand side, Chianti olive oil and tourism or guest houses that can go into a market basket. And, and common goods, screen that's um, heritage or landscape and terroir product combine those two pieces right hand side and to build that link there has to be a local governance to between the two pieces and also coordination in the private sector is indispensable and uh, local governments need to build systems and rules to to make that system work. And in the Kanti region, that um, goods in the service basket, this is a Kanti. And as a terroir, terroir product, we have a Kanti Crasco wine in olive oils. And the wine in olive, the same producer can produce wine in olive and they provide accommodations and tasting uh, service. And there's an organization of producers to produ um, produce and provide the goods and service. And uh, as a local commons or common goods, there's a Toscana hill tops or the cypress and the firm frames in the vineyards that can be a common goods. And Jin Nai-san, the professor, was talking about Baldocha, and that it, that is the uh, local common goods in this region. And also we saw some old um, buildings, firm houses introduced in uh, Professor Jin Nai's presentation. And as a, a community governance, Consortium, um, this is on top of consortium governance. 
There's a community, community and there's also a、um, local promotional project being、um, promoted. And Euro Canty was a leader project that executed in the EU as a EU agriculture promotional policy. And this is a Toscana region, Canty in Toscana region. From、uh, Firenze, it's close from Firenze、um, International Airport. There are a few airports around, and LCC、uh, airplanes land those、um, airplanes. And there's a high demand for second houses、um, from UK or many、um, international、um, customers or consumers. They build their second houses in this region. And Canty, for Canty, the importance of there's a importance of history, as Professor Jinna was touched about. This is a Mesadoria system called sharecropping system Mesadoria between the landowner and the peasant. They share crops, so that's a sharecropping system. Um, this history aspect is very important, and Canty wine is a Renaissance. The Medici、uh, highly thought of the quality of wine, and in 1716, Toscana Costa Medici third. For the first time,、uh, he promulgated. Um, promulgated something very similar to geographical indication. In Tuscany, historic, from historical aspect and、uh, landscape of Tuscany, was, is, uh, was being created through history. And、uh, after the World War II,、uh, Italy Communist Party、uh, hold the reins. And, In the Tuscany Communist Party,、um, secured majority of seats in the parliament, and the peace. Then the community、uh, Communist Party was supported by peasant and farmers and the、uh, workers in the Firenze. Also supported the Communist Party, and that's how the local municipality was governed. And rural gentrification about rural gent gentrification. I would like to talk about、uh, rural gentrification in Canty, the first in Tuscany. In Canty, there's a in 1940,、uh, someone from a female from Switzerland started a first guest house, and followed by Germans and、uh, British and Dutch people to、um, they open up guest houses to serve.、Um, Visitors from their own countries, and there's the local people also purchased guest houses to follow the businesses introduced by foreigners. And the rural what rural gentrification this means is that it's a there's an agriculture aspect and also to create.、Um, That to leverage landscape and agriculture, as agriculture became marginalized, middle classes、um, um, came up with new demand for second houses, and that created demand for second houses being built, and that was supported by EU、uh, rural promotion、um, policy to manage.、Um, Landscapes and also buildings, and the diversity of territorial promotional projects. I like to talk to you about the diversity. And on the other hand, in regards to County Classical Wine Consortium, that's why making organization targeting at the world wealthy people and export of high-end wine. So they started to promote wine tourism like this. On the other hand, there are eight communities around County. 
のですね、まあ、市町村連合のですね共同体はですねチャンティっていうのはワインとツーリズムには還元できないんだということで、まあ、あの当時サハライタリアとはじめとしたサハラの強かったもので、まあ、あの当時は強い国民の力で、そういう国民の労働者たちの力で、そういう国民の力で、Engaged in eight communes, and their residence and their buildings need to be arranged, and factories and plants have to be invited to the area. So they had this kind of way of thinking at that time, and then these two projects. Had a lot of conflict, but they coexisted somehow at that time. And in 2003, in leader project of EU rural development policy, as I said, Euro County was established, as I said earlier, between two forces or groups.、Uh, they had repeated conflict, so in, along the way, they sometimes experienced a setback, but recently, In order for them to try to、uh, include the county wine in the list of UNESCO heritage,、uh, they established a district for this. So, these two projects, through many conflicts, Exist for consortium. Terror agriculture has wine making companies and alternative wine locally produced and locally consumed agriculture based on proximity. Target at a small scale complex businesses or management. And on the right hand,、uh, left hand side, they try to focus on international market to invite、uh, more tourists as well as import increase. And on the right hand side, they focus more local people for local production and local consumption. And at the end, Currently, in the EU, they also have green deals and the strategy from farms to table. So, they are trying to pursue growth, but on the other hand, either growth or maturity, Mr. Yoshinori Hiro used the word. And when we think about the rich territory in Italy, it gives our tips for us to think about maturity. And also, Mr. Shigeki Uno used the word crisis of democracy at the local level. When we think about democracy as a flexible approach, a territorial could be used to solve the problem in the future. Sorry, I talked a lot, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Professor Suda, thank you so much. So, we would like to have a short break here. We will resume the session at 2.30. We are having a short break. And please be back to the computer at 6.30 your time. Uh, thank you very much for waiting, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to resume the symposium. So there are three presented from Italy、uh, real time online. To begin with,、uh, Professor Andrea Mascotti,、uh, Department of the Rural Tourism and the Ruralization of the Study. Andrea, could you start your talk, please? Yes, of course. Thank you.、Um, I'm trying to share my screen.、Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we do. I don't see my screen. Okay.、Um, Good morning, first of all,、uh, to you all.、Uh, it's、uh, in the morning here in Italy. Good afternoon to all of you being in Japan now.、Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to、uh, thank the organizers for、uh, this meeting.
for inviting me both to contribute to this interesting book and to introduce the contents of the chapter I wrote with my colleague, uh, Professor Giovanni Belletti from the University of uh, Florence. Uh, let me thank in particular Professor Junko Kimura for her kind patience in having to deal with me at a distance. It's a really pleasure and honor to be here uh, this morning. Um, of course, it's a pity not to be in presence, uh, and uh, I really wish all this situation will end soon. So, um, the aim of this presentation uh, is to show how networks in food systems and rural areas uh, in Italy have deeply changed in the course of the last, let's say, 70 years, following the turn from productivism to multifunctionality as dominant paradigm in agriculture and rural areas. And I will try to show how, starting from approximately mid 20th century, so after the Second World War in particular, agriculture and rural areas have been subject to strong pressures and changes is from the spread of productivist paradigm, which affected the shape of relationships between actors and therefore the shape of networks in rural areas and in the food system. Then, uh, starting from the 80s approximately, a gradual change to the dominant paradigm of productivism started to show up, bringing a big change in the kind of relations and networks among local actors in rural areas. Indeed, this change, as we will see, was due to the societal acknowledgement that agriculture and rural areas had not just the single function of producing food more and more at cheaper prices for the population, but also a wider and a growing set of functions that is the concept of multifunctionality that has been already recalled in the previous presentation. And multifunctionality implied stronger relations between actors at local level and at territorial level with the birth of new policy tools and normative frameworks from the European Union, but also at lower territorial level with the birth of a new policy stimulating uh, territorial development projects around food and rurality. Um, the origins of productivism in the, was in the industrialization of food over the last, let's say, 200 years, and its concomitant advances in chemical, transport, and agricultural technologies. Over this period, food supply in many parts of the world has moved from often local, small-scale production to concentrated production and mass distribution of foodstuffs. And the overarching goal of this paradigm of productivism was to increase output and efficiencies of labor and capital for increasingly, increasingly urbanized populations. In other terms, the main, if not the only uh, aim of, the, of this paradigm was to produce more and more quantity of food at lower and lower production costs, also in order to ease, to support the industrial growth rather than the agricultural growth, and especially urban cities rather than rural areas. Productionism developed a science-based approach to achieve the goals of increasing output, so that universities, colleges of agriculture, extension services, and other supporting activities were gradually incorporated in, into this paradigm, which came to dominate food policy after the shortages and failures of the pre-World War II period. All this for agriculture implied the increased use of inputs and of plant and animal breeding, the growth of fewer but larger farms, and mechanization and reliance on fossil fuels. Throughout the world, 
the governments created new national and also international policies designed to support the increase of production by applied large-scale industrial techniques that applied modern chemical transportation processing and farming uh, technologies. So, uh, from the point of view of the networking in uh, rural areas and agricultural areas, productivism, so the trend towards uh, intensification of production, mass production, mechanization, industrialization of processes, implied breaking the link with the territory, with local resources, with local culture, with local knowledge, and also breaking the links between farmers and in general producers. And the growing insertion of agriculture into the global system, the global food system, with vertical integration and mainly dependency from external companies in food processing and distributing. All this brought to stronger criticisms, especially starting from the 80s. Notwithstanding the merits of this paradigm, as you can see from the chart uh, at the right of the slide, this is a chart showing the increase of productivity of some cereals in France. And you can see this starting from the 50s. Uh, so after the Second World War, there was a dramatic inc continuous increase in the productivity of uh, wheat uh, uh, and other cereals, while it was rather stagnating in all the, I would say, centuries before this period. So notwithstanding the growth of production and the fulfillment of society's needs in terms of food production and food availability, um, some criticism started to show up for the productivist narrative because it created a distorted development in the sense that it favored big farms, better positioned as resource endowment and localizations, and on the other side, lower benefits to small scale farms and marginal mountainous uh, areas of our country. It created a destructive development with high negative impact on the environment, on landscape, on land management, on water use, chemicals, et cetera, and also negative social and cultural impact, especially, again, in marginal rural areas, and also negative impact, destructive uh, impact on food quality, because the aim was to produce food, just food, and consumers did not pay attention to the quality of food yet. Uh, it created a directed development because agriculture was inserted in a global food system and it was directed by outside uh, institutions, firms, uh, public authorities, extension service universities, losing the links with the territorial specificities. And it created a dependent development because as someone uh, said before me, uh, there was a high effort from the public policies to give money to agriculture in order to achieve all these objectives. So in light of this um, criticism to the effects of, of, of productivism, and also due to um, uh, changing societal and consumers' needs in the, in the 80s, um, all this brought to a revaluation re of both agriculture and rural areas. These images that I showed in the slide are all front pages of magazines that, starting from the 80s, appeared on the market. Underline the desire, not just in Italy, actually, although I'm talking specifically of Italy, to know more about rurality and food, trying to capture the interests mainly of urban citizens who saw in the countryside and in its products and services a means to escape from growingly congested and polluted cities where social relations had become very difficult. 
difficult in, in urban areas. So, um, I have tried here to show the main directions in which the new trends of consumers and citizens and the new attention paid to agricultural and rural areas showed up. A first axis concerns the attempt to rebuild trust relationships between consumers and agri-food system, searching for more information about products and the processes and also territorial origin of products but also a, an attempt to reconnect more directly product production to consumption producers farmers to consumers and this showed up in the enormous uh, spread and infusion of short food supply chains initiatives such as farmers market community supported agriculture and so on a second axis asked for reducing the industrialization of food and brought for example to reevaluate traditional and origin food such as the pdo and pgi products uh, professor junko kimura talked about uh, before and more in general to use softer technology for processing food and the reduction of preservatives and in general less industrialized food and the third axis was focused on the environmental impact leading to a demand for higher care of the environment and agrobiodiversity and from here the diffusion for example and the success of organic products Um, these new trends coming from consumption and societal new needs forced a sort of shift of paradigm for agricultural activities too. So from monofunctionality, one single function that uh, the paradigm of production uh, productivism had, so that of producing food and fiber, towards many functions that agriculture could accomplish, could provide to society, such as hospitality, for example, agritourism, diversified diets and not just mass production and standardized products, high quality food, keeping rural traditions and cultural heritage, protecting biodiversity and especially agrobiodiversity, the environment, landscape, social relations within the countryside, producing energy, a lot of new functions that uh, agriculture could accomplish. Uh, this uh, implied uh, the provision of new function, the new function asked by society and citizens uh, required farmers and producers more in general in rural areas to change their production model and the organization of the production of goods and services. For example, Agri-touristic activity uh, was uh, an, an example of how agriculture could mobilize the many capitals, the economic, the social, the cultural, and the symbolic one, in a way to offer an integrated bundle uh, group of products and service to customers. And moreover, agrituristic activity asks for a higher connection with other attractions and resources in the territory. Uh, this means that as compared to productivism, where there was a break of the links between uh, the food system and the territory, in the multifunctionality paradigm, there was a recover of relationships within the territory and between different typologies of actors, farmers, for example, the yellow circles, but also public also local public authorities, hospitality, museums, cultural events, etc. So there was a strengthening and the need of strengthening local territorial relations within the territory and the recover so of the meaning of the territory as mobilizing local specific local resources specific local capitals uh, an example 
is um, the, wine, the food and wine rules uh, already mentioned uh, before. A food and wine route aims at integrating origin products such as the PDO and the PGI products, but not only those, and tourism, giving them coherence and visibility on the market through the organization of a network of both private and public actors and related common activities and services. In Italy, almost all the regions have released new um, laws regulating the wine and food routes, which normally ask for the setting up of an association of the producers and other institutions participating to the initiative, a regulation about the criteria asked to producers to join, the characteristics they must have in order to join the association and therefore the wine and food route, mechanisms to take decisions and the typology of the initiatives that can be implemented, such as promotion, quality control, etc., by the wine and food route. Participation to a food and wine route places the producer in a local network, which includes other farms, companies from other sectors such as hotels, restaurants, and also local public authorities, museums, um, consumers association, cultural associations, in order to create a sort of basket of good that have, has been mentioned um, by um, Mr. Suda before, in a way to connect all the resources uh, of the capital of the territory to offer a unique image, a sole image to the tourists uh, outside the territory. This is just a, a, an example, I would say an old example of an initiative of network or local networking in, in, in Italy. But more recently, uh, some other typologies of networks have been developing uh, in Italy. Again, not just in Italy, in, in all Europe. Um, if the territory wants to compete with other territories, all the resources and activities have to be coordinated to give a common and shared message to consumers. This implies some forms of coordination among actors in the given territory, and also a common vision, a common strategy, and an action plan. Looking at Tuscany, for example, but also at the national level, at Italian level, new normative frameworks, new tools have been made available uh, for local stakeholders to set up and strengthen already existing networks around food and rural resources. Some examples are listed in the slide. Food communities, rural districts, organic districts, local food plants, and again, of course, food and wine routes, and many other tools. These mean, for example, food communities are initiatives linking together all the companies, farmers and other producers, and local institutions around the provision of food in a given territory. So there, there is a creation of a network. Um, there is a creation of a network um, between uh, local actors at local level that join together to write so, or discuss uh, how to valorize and to support all the activities linked to food and ensuring the link between um, rural areas and agricultural areas and also uh, cities, nearby cities. Um, this is an example of a food community in Tuscany that is in Garfagnana, that is a, a small part of the territory in the province of Lucca. And these are the kinds of activity that this community of food, this food community uh, is trying to achieve, quality, fair and sustainable food in the area, environment, promote environmentally sustainable production processes, promoting short food supply chains, 
uh, education, participation and inclusion of people and also disadvantaged uh, people, valorization of Garfagnana territory as a whole, and strengthening connection and networks. So cooperation and sharing of principles, of rules, of actions, and so on. Coming to the conclusion, just to recap the main thing I've been saying, we have tried to show the shift of paradigm from productivism to multifunctionality, and mainly its implication for networking in rural areas and the food system. Productivism brought to a centralized and top-down governance in food system, breaking the links with territories that were gradually inserted in the global system. The shift, gradual shift towards multifunctionality implies new form of territorial networks. So new forms of localized networks are therefore the result of this process, which now asks for new formal and informal institutional settings and tools, new competency, new resources, as I've tried to show. Arigato gozaimasu. Sorry for being a bit long. Thank you, Andrea. We hear you well and enjoyed your talk. Next. ステータスしました。次はバルバラスタニシャ先生の講演です。バルバラスタニシャ。新しい we hear you well. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Thank you. So first of all, thank you Junko Sensei for your introduction and uh, for having already um, introduced the topic I will try to develop today. Which are the objectives of my presentation? I, my aim is to show the existence of a nexus between quality food characterizing specific regions, traditional eating habits and diets connected to those foods, and culinary, gastronomic, wine and food tourism. Um, in um, Italy. I deliberately chose to use three different expressions for um, what we can define as culinary, gastronomic, wine and food tourism, because these are the three different ways that this type of tourism is known in the scientific literature. So I will alternatively, uh, alternatively use the three uh, ways to define this type of tourism. My second aim is to show how the existence of such a nexus can lead to innovative forms of development in marginal areas. And I will try to highlight the role of territorio in um, this um, process. I will also try to provide examples of rural development linked to culinary tourism in marginal areas in three Italian regions. And uh, I will also try to highlight the changes induced by the COVID-19 pandemic and the possible future for rural marginal areas in Italy. My presentation is composed of three sections. In section one, I will very briefly summarize um, the historical and theoretical framework for culinary tourism and rural development in Italy. And this will come from my perspective. Um, it means that this is my interpretation of the historical and theoretical framework. In section two, I will provide examples in three Italian and Adriatic regions of gastronomic tourism and rural development. And in the final section, I will 
um, say something about the changes induced by the pandemic and future perspectives for rural areas in Italy and conclusions. So let's start from the um, section one, from the first part of my presentation. My intention is, in a way, to tell you a story. And in order to start with my story, I will uh, start from a um, quotation of a sentence of Jean Robert Pitte, um, French geographer, who to 20 years ago wrote that gastronomic products are expression of the culture of national and local communities as much as visual arts, music, and theater. If I translate, of course, not literally, but if I translate um, into ideas that sentence, what I can say is that gastronomic products can be considered as intangible cultural heritage. And of course, this is not my idea. <laughs> this is a very well-known and well-established idea to the point that in 2013, the um, UNESCO inscribed in the list of intangible cultural heritage of the humanity, both the Mediterranean diet and the Washoku. I will not talk about Washoku in this context because I do not know uh, enough about that, and you for sure know much more than I do. But indeed, I would like to uh, start from the, a brief description of Mediterranean diet. What is the Mediterranean diet and when and how was it discovered and codified? So once upon a time in Cilento, but this is the beginning of my story. Cilento is a territorio. We heard already a lot uh, this word uh, this morning. I mean, this afternoon for you, for me, it's uh, uh, early morning. Cilento is a territorio located in the southern part of Italy, south of Naples. This is an image of today, uh, Cilento. You can admire the beautiful coast and the beautiful Iranian Sea. But once upon a time is the end of World War II. The war is um, hitting, strongly hitting Italy and Japan, by the way, among other countries. The Allied troops, the US military force, um, arrived to Italy. And together with, with them, there was a biologist and physiologist expert in cardiovascular diseases named Ansel Keys, who arrived to Italy following the um, Allied troops uh, to take care of their uh, health. What happened is that Ansel Keys uh, remained um, in Italy also after the World War II ended. And he started observing some interesting phenomena um, occurring in Cilento. That was the extremely else, uh, extremely good else of its inhabitants, and the very high longevity. There are several. There were already, and above all now, there are several people, several residents of Cilento who are over 100 years old. So in 1958, as you can see, we are uh, much after the, the end of World War II. In 1958, together with several other scientists, he started the so-called Seven Countries Study. It was a comparative study concerning eating habits, lifestyles, and cardiovascular diseases in seven countries. And Italy and Japan are um, not by chance two of them. The study is continuing, and there are several publications um, that were produced by uh, the scientists belonging um, to that study. In 1975, so more than 15 years uh, later, the Enzotis and um, his group of researchers based in Italy um, codified the existence of a Mediterranean way that um, connected the eating style, the, the living style, and the good health. So the book published How to Eat Well and Stay Well, the Mediterranean Way, 
was published. So what is the Mediterranean diet? What does it consist of? In Japan, you can find a similar diagram depicting the washoku. But I, I will stick to the Mediterranean diet. I took this pyramid. There are several ones um, available. One of them, for instance, also produced by um, my colleague Armando Montanari, who will intervene after I do. I've chosen this um, pyramid that was um, produced by um, a group of scientists belong to several uh, associations that you can read here. And this is a pyramid uh, depicting the comp components of Mediterranean diets. Mediterranean diet, I will not um, say uh, a lot about that because I have no time to do this. I will just highlight two aspects. One aspect is that the Mediterranean diet and the Mediterranean way encompasses a very large consumption of fruits and vegetables and of uh, cereals. And, and this is a tangible aspect, uh, aspect linked to the food as a um, product, but it also encompasses intangible aspects that are um, culinary activities, conviviality, uh, adequate, adequate rest, and the consumption of local products produced in a traditional way, respecting biodiversity and seasonality. So if we think about this aspect, that is the intangible aspect, we can think about a movement that has already been mentioned this morning by Jinai Sensei, that is the slow food movement. Um, we move again in time. I talked about the book of uh, Keys and Keys of 1975. Um, we are again in the 70s. Um, Italian regions, and not only Italian regions, you know, several European regions were going through a process of marginalization of rural areas linked to the industrialization and urbanization processes. And as a reaction um, and the continuation of that process was that during the 80s, rural areas in Italy went um, to uh, be hit, they were hit by the um, globalization that was imposing its strengths that brought to uh, standardization and homologation processes in the um, production. And Pro Professor Marisotti has already said a lot about this. So what happened during the 80s? We move geographically again. We move to Piet the Piedmont region, to the area of Lange in a little town called Bra. It's here in Italy. Uh, this is just the image of Lange, that uh, landscape of which has been included in the list of intangible cultural heritage um, in recent years. In Lange uh, and in the municipality of Bra, uh, a very famous person called Carlo Petrini was born. And um, Gina Sensei has already said something about this. Carlo Petrini in 1984 um, founded a movement called Pachibola that in 1986 took the name of Slow Food that many of you may know. Which, which is a slow food philosophy. Slow food philosophy is the consumption of local products linked to territorial, the respect of traditions in production systems and consumption habits, the culture of slow, slowness, sustainable agriculture, biodiversity protection, and awareness raising for taste and consumption habits. And Jinai Sensei has already shown the I think the Japanese version of this book, that was Buono Pulito and Giusto, published by Carlo Petrini. Buono Pulito and Giusto means good, clean, and fair food. In a way, it means ethic food. And it reminds to me the Chishan Chisho movement in Japan that you know uh, much better than I do. 
and this is the slow food movement um, symbol. So motto is good, clean, and fair food, buono, pulito, and giusto. And the um, image, the brown, the label representing slow food is uh, the snail, um, meaning the slowness. Let's now move to um, the 90s and the 2000s in our story. Um, as a result of all uh, what was happening during the 70s and the 80s, 90s, the 90s and the 2000s were the decades in which a very big scientific debate based on a very um, big change in uh, reality. Uh, Professor Mary Skotki has already explained the uh, shift from productivism to multifunctionalism in uh, Italian rural areas. Uh, the scientific debate and the changing reality um, shed lights on the um, dichotomy between local products and global products in uh, rural areas, between quality production versus quantity production um, in rural areas, the dichotomy between local traditions and uh, global trends. Um, what happened in that period was that in rural areas in Italy, and not only in Italy, also in other European rural regions, the culinary tourism um, became more and more important. And in my view, rural tourism that encompasses culinary tourism can be considered as a leverage for the development of marginal areas facing the challenges posed to agriculture by globalization. And what we uh, could see during the 90s and the 2000s was a conversion uh, of rural areas from areas um, supported by the primary sector, by agriculture, uh, to areas supported, economically supported by the tertiary sector. So, I uh, see in the paradigmatic shift uh, process of tertiarization of rural areas economic system. So culinary tourism can be considered as a way to regenerating rural marginal areas in countries characterized by mature economies. And in this sense, Italy and Japan can be uh, assimilated. It's a way to creating new forms of income and employment, to maintaining environmental, social, and cultural integrity, to preserving traditional landscapes, to promoting local, local products, and also to educating tourists and consumers on conscious consumptions. Question is, can we apply this paradigm to all the rural areas? My answer is no. My answer is culinary tourism as a leverage for rural development is possible only under given conditions that I try to summarize and list here. Local products must be the expression of a given territory. They have to belong to the history of tradition of a given territory. They have to be characteristic of, and they should also characterize of a given territory. They should be good. They should be characterized by short chains and they should have a symbolic uh, value. So if I want to use two words to um, summarize all these elements of identity, diversity, authenticity, originality, quality, symbolism, and what was defined as geography of taste and taste of geography by um, Jean-Robert Pic, Massimo Montanari and Armando Montanari, I have to refer to two concepts that have already been used a lot this morning. And the two concepts are the one of terroir and the one of territory. For the terroir, I chose the definition of um, geographers. Terroir is, in my interpretation, the almost mystical combination of all aspects of soil, climate, and landscape. And then for territorial, I chose my definition. A definition I gave for the first time almost 20 years ago. 
For me, territorio is a combination of land and soil, of landscape, history, culture, traditions, and local community characterizing a specific region. So as you can see, territorio encompasses all the natural, physical, um, and human dimension of a given uh, region. So let's quickly move to section two. Uh, since my time is running fast, I will give example of three Italian areas. I will start from Valeritia in Cugna, and I will not say much before Jinai Sensei has already talked about this. Valeritia is in the Cugna region in southern Italy, and there are several municipalities that have the characteristic of being. Um, presenting very pecu peculiar architecture. In fact, some of them are in the list of it, in the club of Ibo di Tibelli d'Italia. They have um, PGO uh, wines. This is Martina Franca. They also have some food products recognized by slow food as slow food Brazilian. And finally, here is Al Albero Bello that has the truly that have been listed in the UNESCO World Heritage um, of the Humanity, which is the development strategy of Valeditia. Uh, the use of endogenous resources, the networking of local stakeholders, an integrated strategy putting together tangible and intangible resources. So the project based on tangible resources encompass the regeneration of old and traditional buildings and old public buildings for new uses. And the projects based on the intangible resources encompasses a series of events and festivals of music, literature, art, science, gastronomy, and local products. As you can see, gastronomy is associated to cultural activities, just to confirm that uh, it is an intangible cultural heritage. Let's now move to central Italy. We are still on the Adriatic Sea, but we are in central Italy. Here we have a town called Anversa di Abruzzi that is in the very big vicinity of a national park and that became famous thanks to a lithography of Maurizio Cornelis Escher that in 1930 drove uh, this. And uh, Anversa di Abruzzi is here. Here, the main characteristic of this uh, territorio is the importance of a farm created in 1977 that is still active, specialized in the uh, dairy and meat products production. But why this um, farm is important? Because the owners were able to create a network of stakeholders and they were able to use um, the traditional productions and the traditional um, landscape characterizing this area for new uses, for new rural uses, encompassing new type of agriculture and tools to relaunch the development of um, that area. And the last example is indeed in Northern Italy. We are in the Emilia-Romagna region in the uh, town of Verrucchio, also uh, one of the Borghi Tibelli d'Italia. Here you can see the Borgo and the, and the Adriatic Sea, and one of the most outstanding uh, architecture, that is the Rocca Malatistiana. In the case of uh, Verrucchio, the, the start of the redevelopment was the crisis of mass tourism in the coastal area, and uh, the capacity to use uh, the Borgo, the local gastronomy, the local uncrafts, uncrafted products, and the castle and fortress for tourist uses. So now, future perspectives and conclusions. I have chosen three articles uh, that appeared on international magazines. Uh, these are... Um, not for scientists, not scientific documents, that are witnessing the change in Italian rural areas during the pandemic. The first big change is that tourist 
interested in holidays in rural areas increase and requiring both accommodation facilities and activities to take part in. And this brought lesser known destinations such as villages and rural areas to take advantage of the new wave of this domestic tourism. To the point that according to the Bordi Pivelli d'Italia, tourist flows have jumped up to 70% in all of its villages during the last year. And the Bordi Pivelli d'Italia are making efforts to attract not only tourists to those areas, but also the so-called digital nomads by creating working um, labs. And the second phenomenon is that also the um, old residents um, that left those areas because they, they were and still are left behind areas, marginal areas, started coming back, taking advantage of the possibility of remote working. And the local administration and local communities are trying to keep those people staying. So my conclusions, I hope I've been able to demonstrate that rural and marginal areas of the building track can have possibilities of development thanks to new preferences, lifestyles and trends in countries characterized by mature economies like Italy and Japan are. But tourist resources for such a, a development are both the tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Key elements of such development are a strong territorial identity, long history well and rooted in the local community, authenticity, diversity, and originality. And that pandemic seems to have helped in a very strange way, rural areas and body. And if this trend is not just a temporary one, it can be the takeoff of a new renaissance of rural Italy. I'm strongly convinced, and I believe I also convinced you that this development strategy can become paradigmatic and can be applied to territory in other parts of the world, including the Japanese ones. So let me take just one minute more of uh, my time for the acknowledgements. I would like to thank Kimura Sensei and Jinai Sensei for having invited me to take part into their book that I'm very sure will be very successful and to be symposium. And I would like also to thank um, Komatsu Yoshiko-san for the care and attention she paid to the translation of my chapter and also Komatsu Goro-sensei for the time he devoted to me for his cultural mediation and for the long, long, long discussion about uh, the topic I've developed. And above all, I want to thank you all very much for having been here. And I will be much more than pleased to receive your messages if you want to, share, to exchange experiences and ideas. And I can stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have to thank you, Barbara Sensei, for the huge contribution to the book and today's symposium. And we really enjoyed your talk. And also, we thank you for uh, the reflecting the influence of the COVID-19. Thank you very much. Mr. Armand Montanari. Territorio and Food Tourism in the Post-Corona Era. Professor Montanari, could you start your talk, please? Yes, thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Kimura and Professor Jinai for having invited me at this event. I already been at the USA University organizing with Professor Jinai an unforgettable event uh, now a long time ago about 40 years ago so it is a pleasure to come back although not physically at the USA university now during the new center during the new situation i have also to to thank the the USA university staff because uh, my computer doesn't speak with the zoom system so i need some help assistance in showing my slides please would you like us to show your PowerPoint slide here? Yeah, 
Okay. Thank you. This is now. Um, uh, what I'm doing, I'm just, uh, my my speech will be organized around the COVID-19 pandemic in a special area, which is uh, the metropolitan area of Rome, which is dominated by the presence of Rome, but also as a, a large um, rural uh, area and agricultural area. So we can go to the next one uh, to explain why uh, I have been uh, concentrated on this uh, part, the north part, the so-called Littorale North, because uh, it's uh, the part which is mainly connected uh, with, the, with the world. This is the, the globalization dimension. I mean, we have uh, a big uh, um, airport. We have also a, a big and important uh, airport port of Sita Vecchia. It's important especially because it's the main port together with the Barcelona of the of, for the cruise and then also the historic center of Rome that uh, before the pandemic uh, uh, situation had uh, uh, a lot of tourists coming, especially from uh, uh, from the world outside. There, there were international tourists. So the next one is is uh, uh, the first uh, part of my presentation will be just to show you an idea to give you an idea. Uh, uh, how it was the situation uh, before COVID, uh, during the COVID, uh, and then uh, which is the scenarios, which are the scenarios for the future. Next one. Um, uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, just the numbers I have been showing you uh, quickly before. I mean, uh, just to confront with the, with the situation during the COVID. So next. Um, this area has a special importance because uh, we should consider that uh, when uh, the Pope and the Cardinals and the aristocracy in Rome uh, during uh, centuries invited important artists, like for instance, Raffaello and many hundreds, they were coming to work in Rome, but then uh, these people, they have villas, uh, they have castles, they have mansions, they have properties, also in the countryside. And so they generally send this kind of artist uh, around. And so we have, uh, we have uh, if not Raffaello, at least the school. I mean, uh, we can suppose that he was going around and giving instruction. And so this is a major patrimony. Then uh, along the coastal area, I use in this map also some uh, dark uh, blue. Uh, this is a special area um, where uh, there is a, a plant, uh, underwater plant. This is, uh, uh, this is a special plant which is uh, very important today because this is producing oxygen. This is transforming CO2 into oxygen. Unfortunately, it has not been considered till now. Next one. Uh, which, which was the situation um, in this area? The situation was uh, lack of health infrastructure, which is very important because for the new dimension of this area, reduce availability of either level school, reduce equipment and poor efficiency of public transport, wine and food offer on not high quality, and then poor, uh, poor Wi-Fi structure. I mean, information and communication technology were, full, were poor. But why they said? Because everything was concentrated in Rome, and then the area around Rome was, uh, in a certain way, abandoned. Next. Um, this is, uh, so all, all these elements that I've been uh, uh, considering, uh, just uh, let me to mention that uh, um, we have uh, uh, two situations. Uh, there is uh, a kind of desert of an under tourism. I have uh, in the center of Rome over tourism, which is a definition which was uh, developed at the international level and is interesting more or less all the major historic uh, cities uh, in Europe and also in the world. Um, then uh, um, around uh, there was no tourism. It was abandoned. It was not known. It was uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of depressed area, relatively depressed, of course, considering that the uh, room is very close. Next one. Um, this 
this is uh, the dimension of this over tourism. This is uh, the question in red dots, uh, the location of Airbnb. I mean, in uh, little time, there was a spread of this, and this was the basis uh, for the over tourism in Rome. Next. Um, this is the symbol of the over tourism in Rome. This is Fontana di Trevi, and you see how it's crowded. I mean, uh, there was uh, uh, an incredible uh, situation here and many other areas uh, in the city of Rome uh, that uh, I mentioned, I've been considering, I demonstrated in various uh, uh, articles and research I did on the topic. Next one. Uh, during the 19 period, the situation, the COVID-19 period, the situation changed drastically. And then we can see the next slide. Um, yes, I mean, uh, you see, this is uh, uh, tourism uh, was reduced by uh, between 70% and 95%. It means that uh, airports, uh, passengers dropped, the number of uh, tourists and the city of Rome uh, uh, dropped of 70%, and uh, the cruise ships, and then uh, I mentioned before that uh, um, Civitavecchia is uh, one of the major airports in the Mediterranean, dropped of 95%. Next. Um, which had been uh, the major, this was uh, a disaster, this was really panic. I mean, uh, we had a lot of deaths the, at, the, at that time. Um, this is uh, uh, the government, due to this situation, was obliged to impose uh, a blackout. Uh, and then uh, the consequence of the blackout uh, is that uh, um, the number of uh, uh, foreign residents working or just uh, spending their free time in Rome, uh, it was almost of uh, 5,000 minus. And then uh, uh, the jobs also were reduced in the historic center of Rome, in the, se in the center part of the city. Next. Um, the, 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 in the center of Rome, I mean, uh, the area was empty, not only because uh, tourists, and especially, as I mentioned before, international tourists were reduced, but also because uh, due to the intensive uh, tourist use before, a lot of people that have been living in the center, they have been abandoned the center. So no tourists, no residents, and then the city remained um, absolutely empty. Uh, let's see the next slide, which is, uh, again, a comparison with the, uh, Trevi Fountain. Trevi Fountain during the, um, the, the COVID-19 and also today is uh, in this situation, is empty. Next. Um, there is uh, uh, the problem of uh, the human, as I mentioned, human mobility is because uh, the, the air traffic dropped. Uh, then uh, there was also a lot of uh, um, work at home, and so uh, there was uh, no more commuting between uh, uh, the periphery of the of the center and the center of Rome, where the most of the uh, activities were held, the most of uh, the, the 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 working places were located. Uh, and then in the following months, also after the lockdown. Uh, this uh, um, work from home, uh, WFH, um, was reducing, uh, I mean, was continuing but for at least 40% of the people. Next. Um, the Airbnb and hotels were practically empty. And then uh, there is a problem that uh, the, the map I've been showing you for the location of Airbnb. Airbnb were normal flats that they were converted, they converted and restructured. And because they were structured, they were difficult to be rented again as a normal flat. Next. Um, there is a, a, a was noticed a new phenomenon that there was a giving a name work uh, Asian uh, because uh, this is a, a combination of the word work and vacation. So um, people since uh, they had not to be anymore com always completely all the time in the in the office, uh, they started to move outside the city in order to 
find uh, better flats or better or mean just houses uh, with uh, green areas. Uh, and then uh, the, the city, uh, we had the science because, of course, the problem of the COVID is that it's a phenomenon that will last for many years. And now we have only some signs. So what we can say today is that whatever was uh, uh, starting before uh, being accelerated due to the COVID-19. Next. Uh, I, I have been, uh, this is uh, the new situation of the market, uh, of the estate market, because uh, uh, where um, the statistical office, the central statistical office is uh, unable to consider, to register what really is happening. And so we have to use other data. For instance, uh, this is the estate market uh, with the new situation of uh, uh, the prices. So it means that the people were going around to look for different kind, I mean, larger flats. If you have to work uh, from home, of course, you need uh, a larger flats. Uh, then, uh, and then, 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 the next one, please. Um, uh, there is a, a, a demand now for going, moving uh, outside the city, but uh, unfortunately, this uh, rural area around the city is not uh, ready to uh, accept the new uh, the new people. I mean, because these are people uh, of uh, higher level. I mean, uh, uh, since uh, international tourists have been uh, anomalous. This thing, the problem, they have been reduced about 70, 80 percent. Um, they, they've been substituted, they could be substituted by um, local tourists. The people they used to go abroad, to travel um, uh, abroad, especially at the international level, and they are not able anymore to travel, and they would like to find a, a substitute near the city. But there is a problem because uh, they are looking for high-level quality uh, infrastructure services, uh, but uh, uh, these things are not yet uh, existing. Next. Um, this is uh, the, G7, the G20 in Rome, uh, I mean, last October. I mean, the Italian government, in order to give some more life to the historic center of Rome, decided to take all the aid, um, of the, the, the delegation uh, in front of uh, the uh, Trevi Fountain. I mean, the Trevi Fountain, which uh, had been uh, full of people before the COVID, that was absolutely empty during the COVID, which is partially empty during the COVID, was used in this way. Next uh, slide is again with the kind of uh, the, the traditional, uh, the toss of the coin into the Trevi Fountain. And, uh, you know, here there is the fountain, that there are the head of state, but uh, and there are not tourists they are at the end of the fountain, but there are only journalists and uh, photo reporters. Next. What happening? What we expect for the next year? So next, uh, next, uh, next slide. I mean, the first point is that uh, there are some uh, activities that have been already trying to adequate uh, their offer due to the new situation. The one is uh, the cruise sector. Um, if you if you want to have uh, in service a uh, ship today, you have to start uh, it 10 years in advance. So they try to reconvert their offer, and uh, their offer now is more qualitative. And I'm just saying, um, of course, it's qualitative. When you have uh, such a, a, a big cruise ship with uh, more than 400 suites, and, and flats um, that are larger than 35 square meters. Uh, I mean, it's a kind of new difference uh, kind of way uh, of making uh, the cruise. Next. Uh, this is also what happened uh, early this year. I mean, the new um, estate price. Uh, you see that uh, there is the map that I've been showing you before. And now with this uh, plus uh, 3%, 5%, 7% is the, the different price of flats, uh, uh, which was registered uh, uh, at the beginning of this year. You see, this is already outside the city center. Next. Um, this is, is uh, what we expect at European level. 
when we speak about tourism, which could be international tourism, domestic tourism, I mean, uh, we have to expect uh, new people because after the COVID, uh, this is a digitized guest experience, a personalization of the products, uh, the people that are um, traveling along. Uh, there is a kind of uh, necessity of uh, holistic offers. Uh, health and well being will be fundamental the sustainability, then uh, the virtual and augmented reality, and uh, probably fewer trips and more staycation. Next. Uh, now, the, the other new things that uh, is uh, going on in Europe is uh, the next generation European Union, uh, which is Italy. And uh, this is uh, the credit uh, they are giving to the tourism, because tourism has been suffered a lot. And so this is uh, the kind of... Uh, uh, policy that uh, uh, is following. I mean, uh, uh, digitalization, female, female entrepreneurship, uh, operation headquarters in the south of Italy. Next. Uh, then uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the, the problem of uh, the investment. We, then uh, there is uh, investment in digital tourism. There is uh, integrated uh, funds for competitive of uh, tourism business. Then there is uh, a sector in this uh, new generation, next generation EU, um, considered the chapter is Caput Mundi, where Caput Mundi is room. And then uh, uh, all the possibilities that they offer to the development. And then a, a new element is also organization of the profession, so tourist guides. I mean, it's necessary in improving um, the quality of the tourism offer. We need also the better tourist guides organization. Next. Um, uh, the, uh, the work from home perspective for rural, of course, if, uh, and uh, we have signs also during this week, also during the month, at the beginning of 22, that uh, this uh, kind of activity will continue working from home. Of course, uh, working from home, it means that people are moving their home from the center of the city and they will move to the rural areas. Um, next, next, next. Um, then uh, I just... Uh, propose some elements uh, that uh, it will be necessary to have uh, this uh, new situation to the better quality offer. I mean, the integration of products, next. The, uh, then uh, there is uh, offer innovation. I mean, uh, we sh never, nothing will continue as it has been till now. Next, next one. Um, then uh, uh, there is uh, two major elements that uh, events that will happen. I mean, the whole year in the year 2025. I mean, this is not to be decided; it's already decided by the history. Uh, there are um, centuries that we have uh, every 25 years uh, a jubilee, and then uh, uh, the uh, the Italian government, the prime minister, decided to. Uh, participate in launching uh, the Rome race to host the Expo 2030. Next one. Uh, there is also a problem of uh, quality agritourism. I mean, uh, uh, this is, uh, is uh, an opportunity not to be missed. And then uh, there are a, a lot of work to be done also for preparing uh, the, the people to change the philosophy of their activity. Next. Um, there is uh, uh, there is uh, some uh, some possibility of intervening on uh, companies on the schools because it's necessary also to reorganize that there are not this kind of structure. If you move uh, families outside the center of the city, you need also assistance uh, for the schools and then the healthcare. And then <coughs> next one. Um, but. Um, the, the, the COVID-19 has been a tremendous problem, but it's also a major opportunity. Uh, the quantitative qualification of the territory will allow new forms of migratory flows of the classes uh, that possess greater cultural, economic, and social possibilities. So it will be no more a peripheral area, the rural area. And then services, infrastructure, and also agriculture uh, will have to be improved in terms of quality um, and so on. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Montanari. Your talk is very, very crucial for the both the business practitioners and consumers. Thank you very much from Italy. Next is again from Japan, Kazuko Nagamoto. Uh, what is the cuisine in territorial? Uh, Ms. Nakamoto, please, floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I am an uh, Italian culinary expert, Kazuko Nagamoto. And uh, about uh, regarding territorial, very appealing elements, which is cuisine of territorial, which is the topic of my presentation today. First of all, the title is a culinary in territorial on the left hand side that was 2000 this is a picture many of bar 2000 years ago on the left hand side you have a set menu and wine and cheese you can find cheese and the next picture is a palazzo vecchio in Valencia. that's where a feast took place in the kitchen kitchen too is the, the third picture and the, on the right Inside, it's, it's that book about regional uh, culinary that relates to territory. There is a story behind culinary culture. There is a history um, scale, and that's vertical scale, and history and local uh, elements that create dish. And about, before I talk about culinary in territorial, I like to mention history of food culture in Italy. This is a very bizarre picture. On the right hand side, you see the giant sleeping, and left hand side, a human. This person doesn't look anything like a person who would eat bread. This goes back to a story in Odyssey. This is the protagonist in Odyssey, and the Trojan reigns. And Torujin War. This is one of the protagonists in the Torujin Torujin War. And once the war is over, he was going back home, but uh, he infuriated gods, and he would have to travel around the Mediterranean. And uh, that Odysseus stopped by. There are a few locations that Odysseus stopped by, and uh, this is one of the Medi uh, volcano and Odysseus encounter giant and Odyssey called a giant, described giant who didn't look anyone uh, like who would eat bread. Bread was a symbol of civilization and the giant didn't have civilization at that time. And there are many ethnic groups residing in Italy, but the Greek, uh, ancient Greek, became uh, became uh, dominant in that uh, area because the Greek Asian uh, Asian Greek were eating bread and the first the first perfume that's where this giant lived this is the cave that's uh, where Odyssey arrived it's called Kuma it was 730 BC the first group of ancient Greeks started arriving to Kuma this is the picture of Kuma on the right hand side of the coastal line and that's where our um, Greek ancient Greeks arrived so that's left hand side illustration or picture describes how um, ancient Greeks arrived and what they were doing at Kuma this is a giant quarry where they cut stones and using stones they cut, they built ruins. And uh, they had, a, they were, uh, ancient Greeks, Greeks were highly civilized. And this is where Pylstum in the South Italy, this um, Pylstum is a significant uh, ruins. And it was a glory of history back then, going back to Odysseus. This is the Odyssey said that he arrived at Kumo. And he came across an olive tree, and the half 
bottom half and top half are different. And those trees were grafted in 2000, more than 2000 years ago. They already had a grafting technique. And uh, using that grafting technique, Greek, one of the grafting technique and one of the things that uh, ancient Greeks imported. And on top of that, they brought uh, bread, pasta, olive, and wine, and almond. And uh, when they, they didn't bring olive oil, but also they brought refining technique. And uh, for wine, they brought, uh, imported um, in brewing and also uh, flour milling and grinder grinding techniques. So they brought all those di different techniques. And the uh, left hand side, this is where um, what you can find at Piastum. This is the foundation of refinery technique. This is 2,500 years old. And the right hand side, this is extraction, uh, olive oil extraction technique. So you can see the commonality between the two. This uh, right hand side is 100 years old. But uh, since 2000, 2,500 years ago, that they inherited the same technique. That speaks to um, the how high quality ancient Greeks and technique were already. And the ancient Romans honored Greek um, the techniques of ancient Greeks, and they uh, inherited techniques brought by ancient Greeks. This is the refinery. This is extraction of all the olive oils. They had uh, already had uh, those um, technique, and they put uh, all the olives and then crush them and extract oil. And on the top of the surface, light oil and oil will surface, and that what becomes olive oil. And Greek, ancient Greeks were the first generation that brought um, the origin of Italy. Italian cuisine. Italian cuisine is based on olive oil, and the Greek, ancient Greeks are the ones that brought olive oils to to Italy, and that was inherited to Greek uh, Romans, and that was the origin of Italian cuisine. And this is the um, grinder that they used to use for uh, create olive oil. This was discovered in Pompeii ruins, so I would believe that this is 2,500 years old, and if you go to Pompeii, bakeries are quite famous in this, um, at this ruins, and you see the picture of bakery, and right hand side, this is a flour mill, and 2,000 years old. And from that top, they wash grains. And the right hand side, you see the hole. And using donkey, and they tie donkeys or uh, horses to turn the grinder. And then um, flour, the ground flour will come out. And this is the ancient bread, and uh, 2,000 years and carbonized. That was those, the bread, bread was 2,000 years old. And uh, bakeries at that point, bakeries in uh, Pompeii. I, it, it's been said that there are more than 30 bakeries. The bakers would uh, bake bread every day, and uh, Pom people in Pompeii would eat uh, freshly baked ba um, bread. And, here, the, those containers would contain olive oils or wine. That underground, they knew that that low temperature were important to preserve wine and olive oil. So they would um, preserve olive oils and wine under the ground. And I saw that picture at the beginning of my presentation, that wall painting of bar in Pompeii. And next to that wall painting, you can see a wine under the ground to um, preserve wine at that time. This is more surprising. This is the fish farming facilities in uh, ancient Rome. 
双子によって、And、at Rome 753 BC, that's when、uh, ancient Rome started. And it went through monarchy and a republic system and imperial systems. Imperial. And that Rome Empire was the. when That Rome flourished the most.、And、during the Imperial Roman Empire, the fish was highly、uh, fish was important to them, so they created a fish farming technique. And you can find that reminiscent in, the, in the South Italy. They fur、um, mussels and they also、uh, fur eel. So these are the ingredients in the food. So unfortunately, so we're not allowed to take、uh, the photographs in ancient Rome, but the, the archaeologists, the Puna Salsa Ricotti,、uh, came here in Japan and he、uh, held the lecture. So he presented these lectures so, on the、uh, Left hand top, you are now seeing the baked box. And、uh, please take a look at the upper part of the right. Have you ever seen this picture? So it looks like a Japanese cuisine. So, The,、uh, the fish uh, you know, put into the oil after putting the flour. So the true name is、uh, Kaupio. Uh, which is also described、uh, in the books、uh, of the ancient Roman people. So, when the ancient Roman people expanded their territories, they also disseminated information of the Roman cuisine. And then, so this、uh, culinary culture has been introduced to Japan. Uh, before Edo period. And、uh, this you know, cuisine looks like a Nambanzuke in、uh, Japan. And afterwards, the uh, ancient uh, the Roman Empire had been collapsed. So these、uh, ancient、uh, the Roman Empire had been divided into the East one and the West one. So、uh, they were devastated. So you are now、uh, seeing. The picture of the kitchen of the monastery. The culinary culture has been developed when、uh, they have、uh, the financial affordability. And then afterwards, if the political situation has been stabilized, the people can focus on arts. How the culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.culinary.
今度本当のプリンちゃんと切り分けがかりの本になりますヴィンチェンツォ・チェルビオという人がいます1581年ローマ法をパオロ三世に使えたプリンちゃんと切り分けがかりですそしてその道具類というのがこの両サイドにあります真ん中これはちょっと後でもう一度ご覧いただくんですけれども包丁を研いでいるところです先ほどのような飾り切りをするためには切るの包丁でなければならなかったで部位分けをするのに例えば鳥ですね鳥を部分分けにしてどこをどういうふうにして切ったらいいかっていうことがもうこの時代に研究されていた。でこれが、まあ、最初のスカルコに出てたものなんですけれども、so、こういうような形で切れる包丁でお客様の前で飾り切りをしていた。So uh, ソムリエが出てきます。えー、一番最初のソムリエはやはりイタリアです。えー、ソムリエ、コッピエレとコッティリエレという2つの名前がありまして、コッティリエレというのはワインを。えー、倉庫から運んできてでそのボトルにどのくらい水を入れるか、まあ、当時は木のままではワインが飲まないでお客様に合わせて水で薄めて飲んでいた、えー、右手の方コッピエレコッピエレコッパというのはグラスのことになりますでそのグラスを、えー、どういうようなワインで満たすのかということを決めていた人ですで私どもイタリア関係の人間が言っておりますサンテランチェリオ世界最初のソムリエであると思いますローマ法をパウロ三世に使えてでこのサンテランチェリオワインだけを知っているのではなくて地理学者でもあった言語学者でもあったという人です。で彼の書いた本、まあ、実際には書いた本ではなく彼が書いた手紙をまとめたものなのですがブドウ品種。もうこの時代からイタリアでグレッピアーノとかそういうブドウ品種があったそのブドウ品種についての説明どこの地方のワインが美味しいというようなことを全て書いた本を出した人ですそしてクオーコがいますもう一度見てみましょうどういうような人たちがどこにいるのかつまりこういう人たちがルネッサンスの時代の食というものを受け負っていたプロフェッショナルだったのですもうすでにプロフェッショナルがいたんですねそしてその時代の十分がもっとよくわかるのにはバルトロメオスカッピやはりローマ法に使えた料理人の本がありましてオペラっていうんですねオペラっていうのは過激っていう意味ではなくて労働という意味なんですけれどもそのオペラの中にいろいろなかなり多くの挿絵が出ていますこれは手中棒と副中棒真ん中のものが手中棒でおそらくこの向こうにいるのは主婦だと思いますこの手前の台を見てくださいパスタを伸ばしてますね右手の方も見てくださいこれが副中央で井戸があり水道がありカードがありオーブンもあった真ん中の人やはりパスタを伸ばしていますその向こうにパスタに使うための道具類があります右手の方を人を見てくださいこれはソースを裏ごしている状態を表しています次これ下準備の部屋ですね左手、先ほどもご覧いただきましたが、包丁を研いでいるところです。右手の方、これは乳製品の部屋と言いまして、乳製品、真ん中の人、ホイップクリームを作っています。手前の方がアフルライトしたホイップクリーム。右手ではバターを作っています。ただのバターではありません。蜂蜜とバターを混ぜている。甘いバターを作っているんですね。And butter to make sweet そして、えー、そういう時の宴会というのは、so、多くの人、300人とか500人の人のための宴会をしていましたから、洋、so、服自体もこれほど多いものであった。ローストをする道具を見てください、左手。So、全体的に美味、ねえー、しく焼ける。ようにというこういう道具も使っていました。For, uh, そして、えー、その道具類ですね、真ん中、seeing, これ包丁はこんなにあったんですね。で包丁それぞれ用途によって。
って、トルタを切る包丁ですとか、パスタを切る包丁ですとか、細かい細工する包丁とかというふうに分かれていました。で、その時代どういうようなものがあったのか、これあの、その例でちょっと再現いたしまして、これはあの本郷のクリマディトスカーナというところの佐藤シェフが左手で作った左手の写真です。作ってくださいました。ティンバロといいまして、型の中にバロを敷き込んで、ソースとあえたパスタを入れて、上にチーズを置いて焼いたものです。で右の方が私が作りましたので、やはり同じティンバロのものです。そしてフランス料理の原料。So, this is the original source of the French cuisine in 1547. The Catherine de Medici married Arnie II. So, when she married Arnie II, she brought various kinds of culinary tools. So, she was. Since then, the center of power、uh, was shifted to France from Italy. And about in the 19th century, the kitchens and for、uh, aristocrats, they would kids,、uh, cook. French cuisine. And at that time, those Uh, the examples of aristocratic culinary, so they are very well prepared dishes. And there is something that missing, missing portion. I have been talking about culinary for aristocrat, aristocrat but what about、um, general people? What, what were they eating at the time? And to clearly separate from the two, we call it cucina rica for aristocrat, aristocrat,、uh, culinary, aristocratic culinary, and the cucina popela, which is a popular culinary. And the popular Cucina Rica, what Cucina Rica is, is that as I have been explaining, Cucina Rica is、um, a cooking prepared by professionals well, using well equipped、um, facilities. This is the, the king's、uh, second house kitchen. So many pans and so many equipments. And、uh, they were literate, so there's a documentation. And this was to a cooking、um, culinary prepared by professionals, and it was to show their power in that, regardless, they、um, brought ingredients far away, they didn't necessarily use、uh, local produce. So, this is one of the examples. You may have seen this. There are a combination of different parts in the Cucina Rica. The origin of Cucina Rica can be found in France once an aristocrat failed. Um, Ristorante took over, but Cucina Povela was a、um, food prepared by moms. They were illiterate, so there's no documents about Cucina Povela, but they always used the ingredients that they can find around,、um, around them, so they would use i n g r e d i e n t in. Territorial. This is a stew、um, of vegetables and pork. So, Cucina Povela and the, one of the、uh, elements of Cucina Povela is a cacciatola. This is Sicilian cacciatola with eggplants and chicken. This is Roman cacciatola. It is、uh, with lamb. And this is、uh, another. Lamb cacciatola in Puglia, it contains potatoes and there's a chicken cacciatola umbria. So, in, speaking of cacciatola, there are so many different varieties of cacciatola, and I listed them up and I could not find any commonality because this is cucina vola and there is no、uh, instructions, and they just、uh, spontaneously. They were born in different local communities. And bread, let's take a look at bread in different regions. This is rye bread in Alps, and this is also in the, what, the east part of 
Alps is German, so I don't know how to pronounce it. And Piemonte, Grissini, and Romagna, Piada. In Riguglia, Focaccia in Riguglia, in the Coppia in Emilia, Romagna, in Gnocco Flitto, um, in the sun, bread in Toscana, and Romagna, um, pizza, bread in Zenciana, and bread in Sicilia. Studio, using dulum flour in the bread in Altamula, Pana Kalazawa in Sardinia. See, those are all um, different varieties of bread in one country. In one con single country, you can find so many varieties of bread because they all came from different territories and they're all rooted in different territories. Territories. Cucina Bola is the local cuisine that is deeply ro uh, rooted in uh, local community. What we call Italian cuisine is local cuisine, or in other words, is territorial cuisine or culinary. It's the Italian cuisine. And in 1967, finally, uh, those local cuisine was uh, documented in a book in an they published book on local culinary. I like to speak to you about territorial cuisine in Japan. Since 1999, for 15 years in Italy, um, to, for Italian professional chefs, I would give seminars. And uh, in those seminars are mainly about local or territorial culinary, and some of my students are, I would like to introduce some of the uh, students, um, this is uh, Mr. Horikawa in Tokyo, and another uh, student of mine in Kotokuji, and he also produce processed meat. And in Komagome, um, Mr. Takakua, a chef in a restaurant, he has a cheese um, facility when he produces his own cheese. And uh, Mr. Iwamoto, a chef in Gai and Tokyo, and not only he um, process meat, but he's a um, qualified specialist to produce certain types of meat and so that territorial cuisine. If, if, if had it been a kutina, like uh, uh, chefs, they would not produce um, processed food, but the ter those who are chefs who learned territorial cooking, they learned to how to um, process meat in territorial cuisine. There's so much variety and diversity, and there's so much gems you can find. Thank you, Nagamoto san. And the last presentation, but not least, I like to introduce and the last presenter who traveled all the way from Kumamoto. He is talking, he's going to talk about variety of Italian wines and territorial. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm in charge of the chapter 8. So I'd like to even talk about the diversity of the Italian wine and territory. Uh, I am a Sanoe, and I study here. So mainly uh, the two parts of my presentation. And then firstly, the Italian and appeal of the Italian wine, and the part two, re-examining the value of the Japanese territory abroad about by the Avinamento. So to to begin with, uh, I'd like to talk about the charm of the Italian wine. So, uh, there are the summary of the history. In BC 8, uh, the ancient the Greeks established the Magna Graecia in southern Italy. It's a very old drink that was first used to make wine in the colonies. And then, so there's a food culture that uh, interests wine and food, which has been mentioned by the uh, teachers in gastronomy, has already uh, occurred in ancient Roman era. Uh, next, so there is a horizontal axis at the Honja. As uh, sommeliers and the wine lovers are uh, really familiar with wine, 
。最も重要視しているのが、so、これらの要素であります。えー、ブドウガードがどのような自然環境で育ったか、テロワールという言葉は、ワイン業界では頻繁に耳にする言葉です。それから、ブドウ品種という最近では、同じブドウ品種でも、どのようなバイオタイプのブドウを使っているかですとか、どのようなクローンを使っているか、こういった細かなところまで議論がなされております。それから、ブドウ栽培法ですね。ただ単にどのようなブドウの育て方をするかだけではなく、最近は SDGs の観点から、大麦コインを生産する農薬ですとか価格の機能を使わない有機農法の方法の要請が増してきております。ワイン上等法ですね。どのような思想を持って、どのようなワイン作りをされているかというところが、ワインの品質の味わいに大きな影響を与えています。次のコーディアンテイストは、非常に数が多く、ワインの資格取得を目指す人たちにとっては、大きな影響を与えていますが、そういう側面もあるんですけれども、そういう側面もあるんですけれども、そういう側面もあるんですけれども、そういう側面もあるんですけれども、そういう側面もあるんですけれども、Other side,、uh, you can see that、uh, there is the only way for the local community to get involved. And then, in addition to the local elements, including territorial and terroir, there is the local food culture, tradition, and history. So,、uh, it is the concept that the comprehensively captures the vertical elements, which is history. So, at present, the wine industry does not have many, but、uh, it's a word、uh, we have to disseminate the information. So, why is the idea of territory so important? First, as a sommelier, you need to see the truth in the glass of wine. So, I would like to、uh, look at it. So, the Wine tasting、uh, is really becoming popular、uh, due to the TV program, the New Year's TV program. So,、uh, there are various kinds of training methods. So, this was the study session organized by me with a group of sommeliers who specialize in Italian wines. So, this is the tag that I sometimes put in the participants. So, seven red wines from Tuscany made this San Giovanni with designation of the origin and vintage. Answer the following question. So, it is possible that the wines from the outside to Scania are included. Yes, so these are the answers. So, on the sixth, it's the Barbalesco wines. But the not only you know, they capture the, the origin、uh, let's see, of the wine, but the,、uh, we have to. Uh, so the participants should、uh, exclude、uh, the wine. So that was the problem. So, the Toscana Scandi Glasco, Piemonte Svaroro. So,、uh, these are the answers. Uh, in the appellation, uh, the production areas and the group will find、uh, different from each other. So, it is、uh, really difficult to identify the production、uh, area and the grape kind. So, there are the three of the main areas. So, this is the question. So, the Campania in the middle, the Toscana, and also the Piemonte. So, the culinary culture has been developed a lot. So, in the book, you are now seeing the detailed information. So, in Campania,、uh, in the ancient、uh, the Roman areas, the wine production area has been expanded. And in Toscana areas,、uh, in the Middle Ages, the Renaissance area, the Eras, the Sante Lanz Radio, the Medici、uh, family culture has been developed. In Piemonte, the state, so there was the Barolo, which is called the、uh, King's Wine. So when you drink the wine indirectly, so they have acid and also the tanning. But、uh, it is matched、uh, with uh, the so called palace, the cuisine. So、uh, this Piemonte,、uh, the state,、uh, King's Wine became really popular. So, Campania, Toscana,、uh, the Piemonte, Each、uh, region has its distinctive feature. 
But uh, so there, uh, uh, there is uh, the things in common. So vinum gastronomia was uh, the key word for including uh, the book of delivery. The way would be different. And you can see the diversity of the culture, so which is based on the territory. But on the other hand, so Taulaji, uh, which means uh, they, uh, there is kind of a common thing. For example, base color and the flavors. But the, uh, they have uh, the so called the nobility of the wine. When at the same time you taste the wine, so you can see in various kind of things in the common. So that's why we can, so uh, it's really difficult to identify one kind of wine at the sommelier's, uh, you know, tasting event. So how about the Kuchina Povera and the wine? Most in the highly in values, the cuisine is the Brutale. So, uh, 90 so, uh, so there is e soil, uh, which is in you know, based on the volcano ash. So, uh, the, it is exactly the same as the uh, no uh, development of the aristocracy in the cuisine. So you now uh, seeing the difference of the Campania, the state cuisine, and the Bajirikata state cuisine. So even if uh, the people are using the same thing, the kinds of great, but uh, so the characteristics would be really, really different. So Arianico Venture is influenced by the covenant of cuisine is very simple, but uh, it has a deep uh, flavor. So uh, it will be matching to the appearance uh, with the Cucina of Vela. So, Italian is the big country uh, which is the number one producer of wine in the world. But of course, there are ups and downs. So, before and after the Great uh, the War, uh, so they had uh, some uh, difficulties. For example, in the South Italy, including the Campania, the state, so they were focusing on the mass production of the bulk wine. And they lost the identity. And then, so, Baloro, uh, which were called the King's Wine, were lagging behind to catch up the trend of the modernization. But uh, the wine growers had a sense of crisis. So, innovation took place in the 1960s to 1980s. The Master Veradino and Baudi di Sangreo of the two you know, wineries became the driver to uh, carry out the innovations. So, in order to increase the quality of the wine, so the winemakers were enthusiastic about uh, the producing the good wine. In Piedmont, uh, there was a fierce conflict between a group, uh, between a group which tried to protect the Balolo tradition and the group which tried to make a new Balolo through conflict between schools of tradition and modernity, conflict between generations and other confrontations, the overall Balolo wine quality was increased. These kinds of winemaking innovation as well as agritourism law and the slow food movement had occurred in many places in Italy. And as a result, Ristorante Trattoria opened in dilapidated rural areas one after another and then they took back their brilliance and the tourists flocked to those places. 
for their wine and gastronomy. This kind of rural revitalization model was created. So now I'd like to rediscover value of territorial in Japan, brought by Abinamento as I'd like value and the attractiveness of Italian wine reconsidered so far to help revitalize rural areas in Japan. Abinamento means a combination of wine and food in Italian. To begin with at present, Italian wine had some core fun among Japanese consumers, but all in all, many people say that Italian one is difficult and not easy to understand. For that, value nurtured by territorial I have shared earlier seems not to be fully realized, utilized at all. When we look at the Italian wine market under COVID-19, export volume of still wine on two liters or less is about a half of French wine and about two thirds of Chilean wine. So this is the market share in Japan, although Italy is the world's top producer. Even in comparison with the 2019 before COVID-19, COVID-19, Italian wine had biggest drop. A magazine, Wands, which published this data, pointed out that probably Italian wine was affected most because alcohol liquor was not allowed to serve due to declaration of a state of emergency given high industrial use in Italian restaurants and others. The reality that Italian wine has not been well received by consumers was emphasized for household use. So why French and Chilean wine are more popular? At first, a critical point here is the history that wine culture came from France. For instance, the U.S. has many Italian immigrants but we don't have such a situation. Western style cuisine in the 1960s and 70s, when wine culture arrived in Japan, was French cuisine. French wine and the French style wine service were introduced together with the French wine, and the wine culture started to take root in Japan. So when we think about it based on French wine like this, grape varieties and the producing origins of Italian wine are not familiar with the Japanese people, and they cannot help but think that the Italian wine is difficult when they see it from the same viewpoint as French wine, then what's necessary is proposal of evaluation criteria from different viewpoints as an alternative. By so doing, I think diversity of Italian wine can be communicated to consumers as its attractiveness. So in order to get some tips for spreading Italian wine in the future in Japan, we conducted a field study to nine wineries here. Specifically, specifically speaking, we sent five questions to them in advance and then had opinion exchange on those questions with them when we visited those wineries later. For your information, we conducted a paper survey only for Borgogna in Piedmont. So I read important point in red line for each question and answer out loud. If you'd like to read them thoroughly, please access to archive video on YouTube later on, and the result of the survey is included in the book too. What is the best attraction of Italian wine from producer's point of view? Bourgogne producing Barolo in Piedmont answered, unique diversity and specificity such as wine yard soil, and the local varieties which bring about a difference in the world market. Next is Fedlali, a manufacturer of a major Italian sparkling wine raised the history of constant wine drinking as food culture as an indispensable drink for their life. What is your biggest pride for your winery compared with the other wineries? Badia Corti Bono, Chianti Classico producer in Tuscany, said that it values 1,000-year-long history and protects long tradition. Fresco Baudi, which produced is why in many areas in Tuscany responded that they don't like to be compared with others, but their wine expresses local tradition, culture, and the typicality. Which country are you most successful for your wine, except for Italy and Japan? What is the reason behind it? Fellari said the United States and Germany. The United States, especially significant contribution to Italian chef living in the U.S. And the FLDD San Gregor producer of Taula Jin Company also talked about the U.S. and Germany. They visit Italy and love spending an Italian lifestyle called the Bella Vita. Drinking Italian wine at home reminds them of Bella Vita. They spend time in Italy. It's very interesting answers, right? So 
So when you actually conduct promotion for your wine in Japan, what kind of promotion would you prefer? Answer from a Kanbo Arle Komete. Best promotion for them is expression of territory and the culture of our wine to consumers. Japanese people love Italian wine and the culture, so we would like to provide a wine to them. And then Tenuta di Capizzano uh, said Japanese people should enjoy at home wine. And what kind of a situation or cuisine they would like your wine to serve to Japanese sommelier, as served by Japanese sommelier? Margie Agricola said, one abinament is special and then never uh, got bored. And the important point for wine producers in Italy, history and the tradition rooted in the life of people for wine, and the food culture rooted in locality and the biodiversity nurtured by territory in each area. And North America is a country, Italian wine is very popular because of the many Italian immigrants, huge consumer market, and the nationality where they can accept diversity. In addition, uh, promotion activity for connection with food and also Cucina Rica and then Cucina Povera with regard to it. And then American people accepted those wines. And uh, they would like uh, to take approach to Japanese market by um, selling their food culture nurtured by rich nature. And this is the definition of abinament and estrogonomia. Uh, please look at the book for the details. So next is the application of Abinamento to Japan. Please look at this one. The top shows basic way of thinking about combination of cuisine and food and wine. Basically, when you consider the a combination with different country or uh, region, this pairing is important. Uh, what is the uh, good part of the food which can have good uh, fit with wine? That is important. This is territory wine, for example, a uh, new producing place. Uh, in that case, even though it's similar wine, logic needs to be considered for combination. But when the tradition is long, wine and then food are integrated as is enogastronomia. Simply put, uh, long history proves the combination of food and wine. And in order for us to communicate better to consumers about this difference compared to French and then Chilean wine can be uh, understood. Uh, various reasons why Italian wine is good for Japanese cuisine. Basically, uh, we have the similarity in terms of topography and also similarity in terms of food uh, eating habit in Italy. It has land, river, lake, plain, sea, etc. And they have rich nature and food, and then they also have many wines for that. Uh, this is the value of the diversity nurtured by territorial. And it's also similar to Japanese Four Seasons and the rich nature, and that can have the best combination with Italian wine. And that is also the competitiveness Italian wine has. So with Italian wine, Kumamoto Prefecture I live in, I would like to try Abinamento here. And what's important here is that which area of Italian wine uh, reflects uh, for this dish. That's also important to consider. This is the sea urchin in Puglia in Italy, similar to Japan. They also eat raw urchin by uh, crushing the shell. So 
Red wine is good here. And then for tuna dish, Sicily and then Sardinia red wine is good combination. And uh, Mameltino red wine is a strong recommendation from me. And similar to sea urchin, for seafood, red wine is a good combination that is done in southern Italy oftentimes. And next is a spiny lobster. In Sardinia, they have beautiful coastal uh, resort area and then spiny lobster is their local food. So Vermentino and then a spiny lobster abinamento is good. So the uh, Vermentino is a good combination. So, and then the Kumamoto is a red beef and the candy class pop. So there are so many ways to uh, have a cuisine. So, uh, there is the, the local way of cuisine uh, for you know, the baking the meat, uh, which uh, would be uh, the matching with the candy classical. Uh, how about the north, uh, the Italian region? So there is this stew uh, with the uh, red beef and uh, um, which is which can be the traditional uh, matching of the wine and the red beef. So you can uh, enjoy you know, the, the wine at your house, uh, the freely, uh, the based on the traditional matching. So the Italy has a lot of tradition, but in the territory, uh, based on the tradition of history, so the sense of values have also been created. So that's, uh, you know, one of the appeal of the pin points of the Italian culture. So a pin amount uh, is also uh, the terminology that's used for you know, matching the wine. When we can develop the you know, pin amount, uh, we can you know, tell the charms of the Italian wine easily to the consumer. And we can also uh, contribute to the revitalizing of the local economy in Italy. And uh, enogastronomy or tourism is really popular in Italy. So uh, not only the pure you know, the Japanese, uh, the washoku uh, with the Japanese sake, uh, you can you know, match uh, the so-called Italian uh, the wine and Italian uh, cuisine, uh, applying the technology of the Italian uh, the cuisine. So, the result for the local areas. So uh, even if uh, our movement would be restricted, but uh, it would be a good opportunity for acquiring the new customers. So I hope uh, these you know, kind of revitalization of the measures would be taken in various kinds of fields. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Kanoe-san, thank you very much. So all of the presentation part by the eight presenters have been finished. So the next we are having the talk sessions. So we will make a preparation. So we will resume the symposium and 4.35. 435. And we start talk session at quarter to nine your time. Thank you very much for waiting. We would like to start the talk session. Let me introduce the panelist. In Tokyo, we have five panelists. On your left, Mr. Tanoue, and Ms. Nagamoto, and Professor Suda, and Professor Jinnai. And from Italy, from Pisa, um, Professor Marescotti from Roma, Professor Stanisha, and also from um, Rome, Montalini. Despite its early morning on Sunday, that we are joined um, by them on live. Yes, we only have so much time, 45 minutes, but uh, we are hoping to have this session as lively as possible. 
and the talk session, I will ask Mr. Or Professor Jinai to facilitate the session. So I hand over the microphone to Professor Jinai. Thank you, Roy. It's yours. And thank you very much for your interesting presentation. And uh, we have different field or expertise and those um, presentations are very insightful to solve our problems in Japan. I'm specialized in architecture in urban city and we have some expert in agriculture or tourism and food and that what is a common here is that in expansion of modernization from that notion, we are in a maturity society and we need to make our shift to sustainable society. And to that end, rural areas need to be revitalized. I think that's the common theme. And uh, we only have so much time uh, for today, but uh, we'd like to ask the expert, ask more questions to deepen our discussions. First of all, you know, I have done a lot of studies in Italy and I have a lot of opportunities to speak to people in Italy. But the Stanisha, Professor Stanisha was talking about the movement of slow food and implications of that movement. And uh, recently, um, I hear the term kilometro zero. That means that there is no distance between the producer and the consumer. I think it's a brilliant a message and Italians has um, way around the words and uh, we all Italian people talk about zero distance between the producer and uh, consumer. So I think that triggered the shift in slow food movement. There are leaders, especially Petrolini. Petrolini, the leader, he is a very strong philosophy and he's a respected figure and that led that movement. But in the local areas, there are leader figures. I would think that there are leader figures who would lead the movement. And I'd like to ask Professor Stanisha to talk to us about uh, more about the slow food movement in Italy. Okay, thank you very much, Jinai Sensei, for your question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes, thank you. The, um, it, it gives me also the opportunity, your question gives me also the opportunity to say something more about slow food that I could not develop given the short time I had. You want me to focus, if I understand correctly from the translation, on the concept of kilometer zero and on the leaderships, you call them leaderships in, uh, in slow food. So let's start from kilometer zero. The idea, not that we can say it started with slow food, but it's a more general idea, uh, is that there's no distance, as you said, between producers and consumers. Uh, which are the advantages of not having a distance? First of all, sorry, if you can mute the other microphone because I hear my voice in the earphones. We hear you quite clearly. Okay, no, but no, I hear no, my no. voice coming back. So if you can, I don't know, switch off some. Anyway, I, I will try to answer. The, um, the first advantage of the kilometer zero idea is that the producer can sell directly to the consumer. And all the, inter all the mediation and intermediation costs are reduced to zero as much as the distance. The second advantage is for the consumer that can, that can, who can pay a lower price for the same product and he has the chance to consume uh, fresh food and locally produced. And if you think back to what I was saying about the Mediterranean diet and the slow food movement philosophy, this idea of uh, consuming local, locally produced food is truly embedded in both uh, those concepts, in both those philosophies. If we add to consumption also tourism, with Kilometro Zero, we have, with that philosophy, we have the opportunity to link 
the tourists directly to the producers. So tourists that are by definition in a given territorio who are therefore visiting a given territorio can experience the consumption of the locally produced um, food and in case of Italy also wine, but in case of Japan, maybe for instance, green tea. And once back home, they can continue to directly buy from the producers, if not in the area, because they cannot be there, they can use the digital platforms. So it's a different way of interpreting kilometer zero from the point of view of tools. Second question, if I understand correctly, was about leadership. This is true. In my presentation, I put the emphasis on Carlo Green, who was the founder of the slow food movement. And, but around him, there were several leaders. One very important of them was Dario Fo, who um, eventually got Nobel Prize for literature. But we have to think that slow food movement without local leaders would not be successful. Just think about the fact that slow food movement is at the moment established in 160 countries all over the world. And in Italy, um, they, there are between 500 and 600 um, local slow food communities, convivia, or uh, let's say slow food chapters. So between 500 and 600. It means that it's a movement very much rooted in the local areas in the Italian territory, not only rural areas, also in urban areas. You have several chapters, for instance, in Brown, but also in Milan. And uh, the big strength is the fact that the slow food movement leaders at local level usually coincide with local leaders um, what I mean is that at local level, um, people who are leading development processes, processes in the rural environment, including the wine and food tourists, are linked to slow food movement, and they are um, stakeholders playing a strong role in um, the movement. So what I can say is that slow food movements require strong leadership at local level, and at the same time, those lo local leaderships coincide with um, stakeholders who are the leaders in development processes in rural areas. I don't know if I answer to in a satisfactory way to your questions. Hi, no, Maria Thank you um, very much for your answer. So you need a lot of stakeholders and leaders, and a slow, this movement is uh, showcased in a broader areas. And next question goes to uh, Mariscotti, Professor Mariscotti, um, about agri-economy. And I, the, your presentation was very insightful, and uh, I study architecture and urban city and I but the, there is a common thread between your presentation and mine in 80s in 80s that Italia it was an important era for Italy to showcase its uniqueness and characteristic but they had design and fashion and Italy were very stickler about their uniqueness, but the creativity innovation were built on Italian innovation and nature. But, the, but what the other important thing is like a family is very important, right? As a producer or as a uh, organization, family is very important. But at the same time, in order to do agriculture, consortium or network needs to be built to empower territory. So, uh, Ms. Professor Kimura would like to ask more specifics, right, about this topic? Yes, I will. Professor Andrea, I would like to ask the following question. Uh, today, your presentation includes theory. 
as a kind of a big picture to be understood. You yourself are from Lali in Pisa, and it's famous for Chile and others. And you work on agriculture, and also the area is famous for processing of foods as well. And at the kind of a small scale level, in your presentation, you somehow touched upon a kind of a territorial or rural areas uh, promotion as a kind of a mechanism or some creativity, uh, whether they have such a thing. Uh, could you specify and then explain briefly about it, please? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. Actually, you are touching one of my favorite topic because as you know, I'm also a small producer of this uh, famous product here in Tuscany. That is a, a cherry, cherry from a small village in Lari that you, I think you know very well. Uh, so I will try to link uh, this specific case of, of the cherry of Lari with uh, what I tried to explain in my presentation. Uh, because actually the case of the cherry of Lari, there is a very small community of producers today, but was very much bigger once, I mean, uh, 50, 60 years ago is a case that can illustrate uh, well the shift from uh, productivism of, of modernization, as uh, he decoded uh, it, towards multifunctionality. Uh, um, actually, the production of the, of the cherry here in this small village that is located near Pisa in Tuscany um, has a secular tradition. It dates back uh, at least 200 or even more uh, years. And uh, in the course of time, uh, the, the, the high importance of this production from an economic I mean, point of view also had the effect of creating a strong link, also cultural and social, between the pro production and the symbol that was the cherry and the local population. After the Second World War, when productivism came and mainly industrialization of the country, the whole country came, agriculture, especially in hilly and mountainous areas, was abandoned in favor of the, in, in the case of Lari, nearby uh, factories and services sector in the cities of Pisa and Ponte d'Era. For example, there is an important factory uh, 10, 10 miles from Lari that is a uh, Piaggio motorbike producing Vespa, etc. The very famous in Italy, of course, as a symbol again. So, population uh, left agriculture and the production of cherries diminished strongly. Also, because they, in the hilly areas and in, in, even more in the mountainous area, production costs were much higher than in the plain. And so uh, production is, uh, principles could not be implemented by small farmers located in these advantaged areas. So the cultivation was abandoned. But with the shift toward multifunctionality and the interest shown by consumers and citizens in not just products and food, but also the services, the multifunctional services that agriculture can provide, something started to um, um, grow again, and the, the interest for cherry production grew again with a small number of producers, especially young farmers, who first understood the change in the paradigm from productivism to multifunctionality. And some initiatives were activated around the cherries and, and then also trying to link the cherry to the other cultural uh, um, social capital in the area. As we got the cherry, for example, um, Lari has 13 native varieties. It means that these 13 cherry varieties are grown only in this village. That is quite a, a very huge number, menaced by extinction, but thanks to the help of the municipality, and here the importance of local municipality and also local level of power in Italy, of public power. And uh, all 
also coupled to the financial aid given by the European Union, some producers started to protect and cultivate these old varieties, uh, abandoning in part the modern varieties that were more fit for modern markets, supermarket chains, etc. Together with this, farmers uh, didn't limit themselves just to produce food, but opened the farms to visitors, to citizens that were interested to know more about the production process, to benefit from the landscape, the hilly landscape of Tuscany, that is a very good uh, capital of rural areas here. And the municipality also activated a network of Italian municipalities producing cherries to support and promote the product. And also started to promote the product with local restaurants here. I'm coming to what Barbara was saying before. Uh, so short food supply chain, farmers market in the area and trying to reconnect directly with local consumers, even not just tourists. Uh, the production of the cherries. So there was a cultural movement because the population is very proud of this product. And the promotion of the product was connected to the promotion, for example, a famous castle that is, that is in the village, a medieval castle, and other food products in the area. So it, it, the if towards multifunctionality offered new opportunities to farmers, especially young, and I underline this, because old farmers could not really understand and keep kept on selling on global markets, on wholesalers, without trying to emphasize not just the production dimension, but also the other values and functions that could be generated by the product. I don't know if this example is uh, understandable enough, uh, and if I answer to your question. Thank you very much for your answers in regards to cherry and the production area there. We clearly understand that at that time in the past, the situation was not so good, but gradually they shifted to improvement. Thank you very much for your detailed explanation. So, Professor Montanari, I would like to ask you, when you're young, as an architect, you uh, focused on the conservation for those uh, older buildings and architecture, but gradually you started to expand the uh, uh, theme or shift to uh, others. And I think you were so visionary. And uh, you also included tourism and in, in gastronomy. So you're kind of a pioneer. What is the thought or what is the intent behind it? At first, I'd like to ask you about it. And then in Italy, it was called the kind of a um, city of art and opera, and then many people gathered to Italy, but when we think about uh, broadly about Italy, it's a kind of um, unlimited potential Italy may have. They have brilliance in Italy. I think they can appeal more about that by utilizing that, and then that could generate something more in the future. So what do you think, Mr. Montanali? My dear Professor Jinai, I would like to confirm you that I'm still young. And uh, also, if I move it, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> in Japan, are, usually we think like this. This is our you are a very point. famous historian, and this is why for you the time is different. Uh, in the decades following the end of the World War II, historic cities underwent intense renovation, I mean, just considering the past, which endangered their architectural, economic, and social heritage. In a seminar held at the same university, when we were very, very young, <laughs> in the early 80s, um, we uh, discussed the danger facing the historic center of Rome and Tokyo, and measures to introduce alternative policies and uh, I remember that uh, Osei has also published uh, 
a volume of that experience, I suggest to the to the new young people. Um, subsequently, um, I considered the problems of the historic centers in the concept of the development of metropolitan areas. In uh, recent years, and up to 19, to 2019, I mean the time of the, the, uh, the COVID, the greatest risk of the historic center has became the excess of tourism, in intensity of tourism, and a, a phenomenon defined over tourism in the, in the international literature. Because this uh, over tourism, the rest of the metropolitan areas, although rural and uh, agricultural area, um, they have been little affected by tourist flows and therefore entered in a, a situation of uh, under tourism and also underdeveloped and slowly degraded and undersized in quantitative and quali qualitative terms. A phenomenon I define as under tourism in my presentation. It's necessary now to operate concretely. I mean, the case of Rome is not the case of uh, Italy is not the case of Europe. Every city, every territory has its own history, situation, culture, economy, and so on. But then uh, in the case of Rome, it's necessary to, com to intervene concretely, I mean, uh, with the concrete instruments, uh, uh, restoring the building structures that exist in the numerous small historic centers and equip them with the necessary contemporary infrastructure and services in order to improve the quality of housing, of tourism, and the quality of life of those uh, they are living uh, there or they would like to move there. So this is uh, a, a possible situation. Dear Idenobu. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. So, as a matter of fact, so Mr. Montanari, Professor Montanari, uh, came to Japan uh, very often. So uh, we had uh, many uh, discussions. Same goes for Montanari. So uh, he was the uh, Montanari. Uh, Assistant. So Professor Montanari has mentioned before that in the northern part of the Rome, it has a lot of possibility to you have the development. So due to the restraints of the times, so I would like to move on. So I'd like to ask you something to uh, Nagamoto-san and Tanoue-san about the culinary culture and also the wine. So since uh, you have you know, talked about the diversity of uh, Italy, especially the diversity which can be reflected to the culinary culture and entry, and uh, specifically speaking, the fact that Italy is drawing the attention. So uh, it is said that the, the southern Italy was lagging behind, and it was a burden uh, to the Italy. However, uh, it has been changed, I think, to the area which you know issues the message of the cultures. Uh, for example, for the, the new cuisine and also the wines. Maybe there are some uh, the necessities. Maybe uh, there is some change of the lifestyles or the civilization or the culture. So that's why the south part of Italy is drawing attention uh, to the many people. And also same thing in the goes for the Italy. The why uh, the southern Italy is now uh, in uh, vigor. Well, the power of the journalists is enormous. As I mentioned before that, the cucina rica, cucina povera are pretty different. The cucina rica is the cuisine for the restaurant, I mean the restaurant. So the restaurant cuisine are highly valued in all parts of the world. But uh, so there is a so-called swing back phenomenon. So why don't we take a look at the local cuisine, the common as the cuisine? So there are ups and downs, and they're swinging from the back and forth. Guadero Marchese, uh, 
Gucci, you know, talked about the latest, uh, the Gucci Nari, uh, who you know, published the book of the local cuisines. So the aristocratic cuisine and also the commoners, uh, the cuisines are both uh, drawing in attention. So, and also the theory of these, uh, the Kuchi, uh, the aristocrat, and also, uh, the, the commoners in Fiji have been theorized. Same thing goes for the tourism. So, there are so many interesting sightseeing spots. For example, uh, Spelto, uh, the flowers of Polenta, uh, is one of the cuisines. So, Polenta mainly refers to the corn cups, uh, the green thing. But, uh, so there's another uh, the cuisine which is in Puria and which is derived from the ancient Greek cuisine. When uh, we describe these things in the written home, Many people will pay attention to that. So, now, uh, you know, the people saying that the Fed in Italy is uh, gorgeous, it's cool. And then the conveying the message with the word is really important. So, that's very important, uh, not only for the Italy, but for the Japanese people. And then, uh, how do you feel about that? So in, there's a comparing the wine in Italy and France. And the grapes for the vineyard in uh, the France are supported by the French government. And then uh, so-called the Supreme Quality of the Wine uh, would be the concentrated for producing the wine in France. But uh, how about the Italy? So there's a diversity of the kinds of the grapes. And then, so, uh, in, you know, southern Italy, so there are characteristics of the wines. So how do you feel about that? Could you share your thoughts? Thank you. Uh, when it comes to the, uh, the history of Italian wine, it always, you know, began uh, with the southern part of the Italy. So comparing to the other part, so, uh, which means that the vertical axis would be longer than the other the regions. And then, so the development, uh, you know, of the vineyard, uh, now advanced in the northern part. But, uh, in southern areas, so, uh, there, mostly lagging behind, so which means you can see the remnants of the Middle Age, the cultivation of the grapes. So for example, in ancient, uh, the Rome, the style, the cultivation of the grape, and uh, you can see the remnants, let's see, of the Napoli, uh, the you know, empires, uh, the remnants, the grape trees. So even now, uh, the grapes are produced from, uh, you know, these ancient kind. These phenomena cannot be seen uh, in the middle part or the northern part of the Italy. So Campania and Basilicata, so they are, you know, raising the same, you know, kind of wines, but the uh, curinary cultures would be pretty different uh, between two regions. So that's why the curinary cultures are different. So uh, in Sicilia state, South State, so the kind of grape uh, would be different. So they have uh, lots of the possibilities. So the personally the speaking, I am uh, you know, the attention to the Sicilia. So, uh, which is uh, in the vicinity of the Africa, very warm the areas, and when we go to the high altitude areas. It, not only the local uh, the kind, but uh, also the the outdoors, uh, the areas they grow uh, the grape Pinot Noir or the leaflings are also the raised and cultivated. So from these you know, kind of wines, uh, they can uh, have the quality wine. So in southern Italy, so they are still producing the wine with diversity. So I think maybe the miracle wine will also appear in the southern region of the Italy. And uh, also the quality will be really high, I think. Uh, thank you very much. I understood very well. You see, the power of the history is enormous, and that they are transcending 
the tradition to the next generation. I think this kind of spirit would also rise in、uh, the Japan. So,、uh, Suda san, and how about you? And、uh, you, you know, started、uh, to have an analysis of the、uh, agriculture in France. And then, so Kimura sensei、uh, asked you to collaborate to、uh, carry on the research. I believe that you found Italy also interesting. I think we are compelled to compare Italy and France, and it was、uh, re referenced in Nagamoto san's book. And、uh, Italy、uh, felt inferior to France in terms of cuisine, but now Italy has been、uh, establishing its position. I think there's a lot of commonality between the two countries: architecture or urban city planning. And、uh, UNESCO landscape is being respected by those two countries, and also、uh, agriculture. They honor quantity over quality, and、uh, for also geographical indication,、um, they don't. Instead of globalization that propelled by U.S. and、uh, France and Italy are on the.、Um, Opposite end of spectrum, but I believe there are differences between the two countries. And can you elaborate the differences between the two? Thank you for your question. Of course, there are differences, and one of the major differences is that in France is a more centralized governance, and Japan,、uh, I mean Italy, is more decentralized. And when it comes to promoting. Uh, rural areas, the way that it's done is different. But、uh, if you look at the recent trend, as Kimura-san was、uh, mentioning, that GI products、um, come mainly come from Italy and France, and terroir product、uh, import export is very important for them. But the、uh, France foodies. Um, their aesthetic to food was、uh, registered in UNESCO in the city of Lyon. There is a museum and international gastronomy was to be established, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and also the mayor of Lyon became was an environmentalist. Yes, and、uh, so gastronomy or shiny instead of ga shiny gastronomy, they focus on more、um, sustainable agriculture, locally produced and locally consumed. So、uh, sustainability is becoming more important in France as well. And、uh, France and Italy, between the two countries, I think they are getting closer to each other in terms of shared values. I think you need to read the trend, and you need to be able to foresee what is going to be important. And I think、um, France and Italy are, I think, front line. I would think, I would say. And but the, if we take a look at Japan, if we turn to Japan,、um, Professor Kimura, but these are. Sense or we can find the essence of territorial in Japan, and if you look at Edo、uh, period, that feudalistic、um, organization or feudalistic communities in Edo era, and the towns、um, around the castle was more politically organized, but there are different. Industries or agriculture and sectors were developed, so they can find different identity and cultural aspect in different、um, parts of Japan. So we had an essence of territorial. We would、uh, use river to for transportation. We would travel、um, by ocean, by sea, and there was a network surrounding 
old Tokyo, but the time has moved on and the system has changed after Meiji era and political system and uh, um, administration system has changed and now we have prefectures. But the, the wider area to, to organize wider area and create networks and local people can join those networks and to build those networks in the wider barriers that it's been difficult for us to exercise that power to build wider networks and one of the other things that's being discussed is that local uh, government governments they worry about what the central government is thinking about but uh, in Italy they uh, municipalities they uh, work together uh, they go hand in hand to develop territorial but uh, in Japan the administration of um, local administration or government is silo organized silo in Japan and for Japan what can we do better Thank you. Thank you for your um, comment. I mentioned in my presentation regarding GI for agricultural produce is managed by Ministry of Agriculture and for liquor is managed by tax authority. And uh, they have different budgets, big budgets, but the, when it comes to collaboration across um, borders, it's difficult, but I have, uh, I'm hopeful this month and on the 25th and 26th um, tax authority for liquor, liquor GI, they had a online seminar on liquor GI and uh, GI producers, about GI producers. Um, they did a presentation at the seminar and for each GI, there are three videos uploaded uh, in the third video it was not um, the producer but uh, for it, it was about um, consumers like a chef or sommelier uh, appeared on the, the third video and talked about how can we mar marry wine and dishes but the many videos, um, the videos, the tunnel with uh, Ambilamento was not about Ambilamento or his, it was not about uh, marriage between, um, it was more about pairing when you combine um, Mary and wine and food what would be the most uh, fitting uh, combination. So that was mainly what they were talking about. But the Hokkaido GI, they presented a map and also um, they introduced cheese, certain cheese and a wine that go well. Uh, but the different sectors, it might be difficult to, for different sectors to collaborate like Italy, but uh, we can do something bottom up like uh, producers, um, they can come together to work more in the light of territorial. But in uh, Jinai's, uh, Professor Jinai's presentation, uh, you uh, talked about Mishima potato. The, the producer of Mishima um, producer, these are someone who is very innovative. He has a very innovative perspective. And uh, there's a Tagonola uh, fish, certain types of fish, GI, managed by Tagonola local uh, fishermen and using Tagonola and they um, invented croquette using local potato and fish, but the 
What is important is not just sell、um, products, but、uh, you know, Suzuka, which is as a territorial. In, in Suzuka, they work beyond sectors at the prefectural level. They're trying to. There's always a movement. There's already a movement to revitalize. Uh, concept of territorial in certain parts of to,、um, Japan, in Kanagawa, Isehara, there's a very interesting milk. It's called Isehara local milk, and Isehara dairy firm farmers produce that、uh, specific kind of milk. In Isehara, they have managed successfully establish their identity. And successfully give identity to the milk because that was led by、uh, local someone from local municipality, and、uh, from designing the program,、um, they involved local people, and then they ran that project in a bottom-up、uh, manner. An important、uh, point is that an、uh, important point is that Isehara. Has、uh, brewed a、uh, field of corn, so many people thought that it's a local food in Isehara. But actually, for their cattle,、uh, they grow. They have grown corn for their cattle feed. So Isehara. Has been trying to、uh, nurture that kind of a、uh, field, so it's a kind of an identity they recognized, and then rather than sales promotion, in order for us to promote territory, I think that it's the important point. I think. Thank you very much. In Japan, we have interesting activities and good examples started to be revealed. So we hope that the、um, kind of expansion horizontally will be achieved through that. We have limited the time today, and we need to close the session in five minutes or maybe three minutes.、Uh, we can have this session until 5:35 in Japan time. But should I move on to wrap up? Can I? Okay. So, to Professor Montanari, I'd like to ask some question or get comment from you. In your previous comment,、uh, for example, we are not possible to go abroad recently, and we try to find something closer to us as a good location. And in Japan, we have started to see that kind of thing happening right now. For example, for me, I organized、uh, foreign travel. It's not possible right now. So in Japan, based on the concept of the territorial, I try to come up with some interesting tour for my people. And earlier, Tanoue-san mentioned during part two COVID-19 pandemic, you found something new. Local food and wine are combined together in Japan through that kind of a charm or attraction. New customers started to be gathered to the specific location in Japan. So COVID-19 could be a kind of a potential opportunity instead of a disaster. Mr. Montanari also talked about that as well, especially in northern part of Rome. That is the area. For people in Rome, big city, metropolitan city, it's an interesting part. They can enjoy some time there. They can also enjoy local food there. But at time, at the time, in order to strengthen the identity of the areas around Rome, for example, to improve the charm, enhance the charm,、uh, for example, cultural heritage or.、Uh, Buildings, how we can put value on them, and what kind of people can be the leader to do that in that effort? Could you specify a little more so that we can、um, understand further in details for us to be able to think about a territorial a strategy? Can you specify a little bit more? Are you addressing to my, to me, to whom? This is the question Hi, for myself. Yes, yes, that is correct. Well, in Italy, ninety percent of companies are small. 
and uh, very small. In Littorale Nord, in the north side of uh, Metropolitan Area of Rome, they are only very small. And then the territorio, as you mentioned it, uh, although is for gastronomy or for tourism or for production, is only one. I mean, especially now we are dealing with integration of all this activity and function. I'm now no more developing theories in writing. Uh, theoretical papers that I did uh, till now being member of uh, a Sapienza, the Sapienza University. Now I'm uh, working as a startup, so I have to implement concretely the theoretical idea. Um, and now I'm working with companies, local authorities, to prepare entrepreneurs administration, civil society to perform what is needed by these major changes introduced, I mean, uh, uh, by the COVID-19, changes that they were already on way, but uh, the, uh, the COVID has displayed, uh, forced us to speed up the process. COVID-19 uh, should be considered as an unique opportunity, but uh, training, education, is, is necessary, is requested. I believe that uh, what is the, by also the numerous meeting that I'm now uh, having with these uh, stakeholders of the territory, education, education, education is uh, necessary because uh, uh, we are making a big revolution in our society. I don't know what uh, we will, in, how we, we will interpret uh, this uh, period, this situation in the future, but surely we are in a period of major changes and transformation. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Education, training of the people, and deep understanding of the region or rural area to be able to develop talents for the future. Thank you very much. I think it's time for me to wrap up. Yes, please. Uh, from various viewpoints, we have uh, received lots of interesting comments, important comments. It's somewhat difficult for me to summarize in one word or in one sentence, so I hope that each one of you can understand how you can interpret on those comments and the information. But all in all, I think the commonality I can find is uh, urban civilization and industrialization. And then after all of that, uh, we uh, have experienced the paradigm shift, how we can uh, develop that further in each genre. For me, in my field, we have seen that kind of a change. And then in agriculture and marketing, that has happened as well. And from growth, expansion to finding out the true value and the nurture and then enhance the value at that time. Rural area, region, territorial, it has nature and history and diversity. And when it comes to globalization, society had started to be standardized, but some, uh, so somehow we couldn't recognize that. But once again, we need to refine it. We discover uh, to do that, we need education, discussion, and conversation and then also we need talent and then talent or people was the word often some people used and from different discipline or field a domain many actors emerged and then they work together to create a network and then that will be expanded to territorial at the end of the day so i think that is very important especially after COVID 19 in the future rediscovery of the value in our proximity. That's a kind of a very creative idea or theory. And actual power for action are also necessary. And then Professor Stanisha said, and I strongly remember that global approach and a pursuit of roots and sense of belongings. That kind of need started to be emerged among people in Japan, global versus local, and then local as a kind of combination. That's the word we often used, but we need to deepen our understanding about that to make sure how we can explore that, how we can expand it so that we can get something as a result out of it. 
In global aspect, territory was a kind of a keyword for today's session, but potential for that nature history and in food culture out of it, and then that will contribute to tourism. So logic and the strategy around that needs to be rebuilt once again. In Italy, based on my experience, a lot, for example, people who are working for agri-tourism and taxi drivers, uh, those people who are involved in tourism have a sense of a global, a global sense, and they also have a sense that they can create it as a bottom-up, and they have EU uh, under a big value under EU. They run a bottom-up project from that, and then regions in Italy can sum them up and then get subsidy from EU and then start taking action in the project. That is kind of a very interesting move we can see in Italy. We couldn't get into the details today, but how we can do that in Japan and in Japan we have seen interesting move already. That we somehow introduced to you briefly, and for today's audience, there are many people who are involved in that kind of a move, and we have heard slow food movement or agritourism from Italy, and Arbel Diffuso uh, distributed local hotel. It's a kind of a keyword. See, we are now entering the so-called the common matured society, and we are sharing the same the problems. So the same kind of problems are lying ahead, and uh, the Italian people had experiences, and you can learn from Italian experiences, and uh, vice versa. Japanese people's experience uh, you know, can have a good influence and good impact on the Italian people. So uh, we would like to you know, further the promote these kind of uh, activities. So the Kimura has mentioned about the you know, agriculture, uh, the cuisine, and uh, so other presenters you know, talked about the tourism. So, Excellent in sommelier has also participated in the symposium. So, you know, these kind of the people uh, will go forward for having the new path. And uh, thank you very much for your attention for such a long time, and thank you very much for your patience. And uh, Professor, and thank you very much on the real time and online participation from the Italy. So we would like to close the symposium. Again, thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Professor Jinda, thank you very much. And the participant from Italy, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Jinnai um, uh, gave us a lot of you know, thoughts. So he is, uh, you know, thinking how to, you know, have the glorious thing to light again in Japan. So the moderator, Professor Jinnai, thank you very much. So we would like to close the talk session and also the international symposium. So the Sustainable territorial development in Italy, so reviving uh, the exchange in between the rural area and the city. So again, uh, presenters, professors, and also the distinguished audiences, uh, thank you very much.